Hey, good Friday morning to you, Real Talkers, and welcome to our broadcast. If you're tuning in live right now, you know it's 10.30 Eastern, 7.30 Pacific. It's 8.30 Mountain Time, and we're excited to have you here for the show. Uh, this one's going to move quick, not just because it's a Friday and a very happy Friday to you, but we've we've got some engaged uh, guests ready to go. We, we did almost a... Uh, we did a bit of a dry run yesterday. It's Friday, which means it's our Real Talk Roundtable today. Although we've kind of turned into uh, sort of a Roundtable Everyday type broadcast, which is great because we've got a lot of people that want to come on here and chat. We've got a, a lot of issues that we're trying to tackle. But traditionally, at least on Fridays, you're going to have a Roundtable conversation that you can count on. Now, here's the deal, though. Today, we're bringing in, let me do the quick math, one, two, three, four, five different pa panelists for this roundtable, which means we have them slated in for shifts. And so out of the gates from, from 9 to 9.30 today, we've got three guests that are going to take on our Y Station question of the week from last week, the one that 1,776 of you chimed in on, which, which we love, by the way, the week that our neighbors to the south uh, inaugurate a new president, a new vice president, 1,776 of you exactly chime in for a survey on democracy. That's freaky. Isn't that? Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Erin agrees, our first guest. She's uh, she's listening along and she's she's nodding with us. Dr. Erin Jacob is going to join us in just a second. I'm really excited for this. Uh, uh, doctor is a con uh, conservation scientist at the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative, Y to Y. You've heard about this. We're going to continue our look at uh, Canada's Rocky Mountains. What's going on there? <clears throat> Kevin Van Tegum, uh, who was on the show just a short time ago, the superintendent, former superintendent of Banff National Park, has been sounding the alarm. He says, hey, listen, there's already mining activity, explore, uh, you know, exploration or, or activities around uh, preliminary activities underway before this stuff's even been approved. Yet he's sounding the alarm. Uh, I noticed that post media newspapers, my parents chimed in from Calgary. I'll, my parents are like my, my news watcher. They're, or my parents might be more engaged on what's going on than I am, which is great because they're always putting things on my radar. Uh, it's great as well because they pay for their content and subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. So shout out to Bruce and Catherine down in Calgary. But they even they said, hey, check this out in the Calgary Herald today. Kevin Van Tiggum is sounding the alarm again. Coal mining is already going on. Now you're going to say, well, maybe not mining exactly, but the preliminary stuff is happening. Albertans are being led to believe right now that everybody's hit pause for a second, that the more than 100, 100,000 signatures on these petitions have meant something and that everybody's going to take a second here. So we're going to get a a real and maybe stark analysis of what's going on and what's at stake. That's coming up. We're also today, well, of course, we'll talk about the resignation of Governor General Julie Payette and the mess that it creates to a certain degree. Let's not discount uh, the personal experiences people have allegedly had. Uh, it sounds like an absolutely toxic and horrific work environment. Uh, quite frankly, she sounds, sounds like a terrible person to work with. I hate to put it that way, but that's pretty much what it's starting to sound like. Uh, you know, she's, one of these things, her official statement, I'll read from it in our nine o'clock news. She says, you know, while no official complaints were filed, it's like, with respect, if everybody in Canada is talking about what the workplace was like, there's really no need for an official complaint to be filed. Uh, a, a review between her and the prime minister, uh, apparently they're taking a look at this report that was compiled. And, and as they reviewed it together, sounds like uh, sounds like the 
you know, the mandate was made clear, which is uh, time for you to resign. Now, yesterday, uh, a good friend of mine, and, and I'm sure you're a fan of hers, if you, if you enjoyed uh, engaged commentary on Canadian politics, Vashi Capello said a great interview uh, with the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs for the government. She's holding his feet to the fire saying, well, did the prime minister ask for this resignation or was it was it volunteered? by Ms. Payette and didn't seem to be a clear answer there. Sounds like maybe the prime minister told her it's time to go, but did she even want the job in the first place? We don't know. We're also going to be uh, our roundtable today taking on, as we said, quality in politics. And, and, and 1,776 of you uh, told us what quality in politics would mean to you. We've got a great panel coming up. Uh, Mike Lake is a conservative MP out of Alberta, and he hosts these Zoom happy hours on Friday afternoons. And he invites people in, uh, Americans, Canadians, Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives, uh, you know, NDP supporters, whatever the case may be. I've taken part in a couple of them. They're 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 Chatham House rules, which which means that everything said there is off the record, uh, which is great because everybody can just relax and have a cocktail or, 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 you know, have a sparkling water and uh, talk about their week, dig into some issues. Um, I've really appreciated uh, some of the insights I've gleaned from these. And, and, and Mike's doing it, I think, because he wants to bring together people of different political stripes and have meaningful conversations at a ground level so today we kind of contracted mike out we said well you come join our round table and bring in some of your regulars at these zoom happy hours so he's done exactly that we're going to meet some really fascinating people including for sports fans i absolutely love and and sam's like losing his mind at one of the panelists, just, just, just a bit. <laughs> at one of the panelists that's joining us for the nine thirty block, nine thirty to ten, uh, perennial CFL All Star. He's a member of the CFL's All Decade Team. Receiver Adarius Bowman is going to join for our roundtable. Did you ever think that you'd be witnessing, uh, let alone technically producing, a roundtable on politics starring Adarius Bowman? No, uh, I thought, you know, maybe uh, it, as this unfolds, if we get close to a Grey Cup or there's a big season, we yeah. might bring some players on to yeah. chat, but um, talking politics, that's new. I'm excited yeah. about so this. So we're going to uh, find out what he's doing, talking know, politics. I love seeing athletes out of the arena. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like when we talked to Andrew Ference about it, when he was talking about being a citizen, like that really resonated with me. So it's it's like yeah. this is this is really exciting for me. It's another another side to him that we haven't seen before. That's right. So Darius is uh, a, a proud uh, son of Chattanooga, Tennessee. So I don't know how he votes. Um, I'm going to be completely rude and break all sort of happy hour cocktail party rules. And I'm going to straight up ask him how he voted and what he makes. Uh, well, I'll ask him if he voted and if so, how and what does he make of of his home country? Well, let me say at least his country of birth uh the united states and it's and it's and it's effort to can, can i say recover from the donald trump presidency can i say unite again i think everyone will acknowledge that's a challenge facing the u.s all right let's dive in here because i also have stacks of emails i promise real talkers i vow to you i'm looking right into the lens and i promise you i will plant i'm going to say a minimum of three trees this year I, I commit to you, I will plant a minimum of three trees based on the number of emails that I've printed out this week alone. Of course, it's Friday, which means we're also getting into trash talk after the roundtable. So let's kick it off with a mention for our friends at Bitcoin. Well, each and every week, they're here joining us on our journey to make sure we're talking about issues that matter. And they want to talk to you if you have questions about crypto. Uh, Bitcoin's been booming in the last couple of days. It's been in a free fall and investors or potential investors are going, I need to make sense of what's happening here. Go to a voice you can trust based out of Edmonton more than 40 employees growing rapidly going public this year Bitcoin well our presenting sponsor real talk starts right now here's Ryan Jesperson we kick off with uh, expertise uh, in science with a passion for the Rocky Mountains and for getting outside, Dr. Aaron Jacob is a conservation scientist at the Y2Y Initiative. That's Yellowstone to Yukon. She provides and studies, uh, you know, commentary is what she provides on conservation issues around Western North American uh, endangered species, wildlife, the benefits that people get from nature. She's advised governments in past on protected areas, impact assessment, endangered species, as mentioned, and climate policy. Dr. Jacob, it's, it's, it's really great to get you here on the show. I want to mention right out of the gates to our audience, uh, based on the news cycle this week, you've been so kind and, and so flexible to allow us to reschedule our interview on short notice. And I always love acknowledging that publicly to say you've already been a dream to work with. So thank you and welcome to Real Talk. 
Well, thanks, Ryan. Um, it's great to be on the show today. What an amazing show you've got planned. This is fun. You know what? And we, we want it to kind of feel like a Friday, you know, and, and, and the, 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 the vibe of this show has always been to bite off issues of substance and chew on them without breaking our teeth, without it being too painful. So, so you're here to talk about something that matters to a lot of people. It's something that, quite frankly, is troubling a lot of people. But, but I think most of us, laypersons anyways, would acknowledge that we don't have all the information and we're trying to understand about the impact impact of of you know tapping into natural resources in in parkland so where's your head been at for the last let's say two weeks as this has been a real big part of public con- conversation yeah what a two weeks it's been my gosh um i've been i've been amazed at how many albertans from all across the province and all walks of life all political life are being engaged on this issue people really care they care about these mountains, they care about the foothills, the water that comes from these places, and they know what's at stake. And you mentioned, you know, these, these issues are, uh, can be complicated or there's a lot of information out there. There is a lot of information. And that's one of the things I want to talk about. We know so much about how important these places are, not just for wildlife and not just for water. Like in the big picture, the eastern slopes are a phenomenally important place for Canada. Okay, so let's talk about this because a lot of people are are, are referencing the eastern slopes, but I bet you, uh, it's like when you ask Americans about Canada, if you, if you put a map in front of these wonderful people not being a jerk, because I might be right here in this community I'm describing, you say, put your finger on the eastern slopes right now, and we'd be like, eee. so where exactly are we talking about and why are the eastern slopes so significant? Yeah, the eastern slopes, so it's the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains. And if you look at a a map of North America, you'll see that the Rockies, you know, they start in in, uh, western, in the western states and kind of run up through the the border of BC and Alberta, and then they start to curve, right? And they sort of go up up into, into western BC. And we're talking about the eastern slopes of that. So it's western central Alberta from north of Jasper National Park, down past Jasper, past Banff, all the way down to the U.S. border. Those are the eastern slopes. One of the important things to know about this place is that it doesn't get a whole lot of precipitation. It's kind of dry, just sort of funny. The other side of the Rockies is a lot wetter. So here there's not a whole lot of water to start with. And the water that falls in these mountains, run through, through those foothills, goes all the way across, uh, across the prairies. So that map that people might be seeing right now is from some research that colleagues and I just published two weeks ago. And this shows where water falls in Canada, like where are the rainy places? And places, if you've ever been to the west coast of British Columbia, you know how rainy that is. We don't have that here in Alberta. Alberta is drier. So it's really important to know that the water that falls here is used by millions of people all across, uh, out into the prairies. If you're in Edmonton, this is your cup of coffee in the morning. If you're having a shower in Lethbridge, this affects you. Yeah, I was I was think of uh, so many people have been in touch with our show referencing Aaron Brockovich and kind of that story that at least some people know on a surface level uh, based on the movie, of course, but the importance of drinking water and, and, you, and you picture your kid, you know, sculling a glass of ice water after playing on a summer day and all of a sudden you realize why you want to protect the water. Part of your job, uh, Doc, I would imagine is is kind of in a way and I hate that we have to do this, but finding ways to make people care about issues they might not otherwise care about. Like if if we talk about you know cut lines into you know into into the landscape here for accessibility for these mining trucks or if we, we talk about you know impacts in 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 you know stream crossings or whatever we talk about and people say it might affect the the migration of or, you know whatever it might affect birds or grizzly habitat and, and the reality is some people are like yeah i mean like i could pretend like i care about this but i don't really care about this but if you start talking about the water their kids are drinking 600 kilometers away then all of a sudden they care a little bit more You're exactly right. And that's what we're seeing with this issue. It's the confluence of not just wildlife and not just water. It's also recreation, right? These are, I don't know if you've spent much time in the Eastern Slopes, Ryan. Tons. If you haven't come out, you know, great. And, and we've been so fortunate in the last year, people who live in Alberta to have this place in, in our backyard, right? So close to Calgary, Edmonton, Lethbridge. And in the before times, people came from around the world to recreate here. And people will again. This is something that we market internationally when we talk about Canada, when we talk about Alberta. When politicians make announcements about Alberta, they're usually standing in front of pictures of the Rocky Mountains. When we made, you know, 
the government made a, a video that was talking to the NHL, trying to get them to come to Edmonton. They're showing pictures of these places that we're talking about. So that's what's at stake. The water that comes from these mountains that people use to bathe their children, that ranchers and farmers are using, that's already being used by industrial purposes. There's not a lot out there. There can't, we can't have more for things like open pit coal mining and we can't put that at risk for contaminating these places, these, these water sources. Yeah. This is a really big deal. You know, and I think I, we're seeing that people are really cottoning onto that. Yeah, on mass and across party lines, which makes it interesting, right? Like I, I have emails in front of me from people that are saying like, you know, I didn't vote for Jason Kenney, but I'm ticked off, but I've, I've got an equal number of emails that say I've voted conservative. I've always voted conservative and this is not what I voted for. So that's interesting. Aaron, I'm not going to get you to comment on, on, on other politics here, but I think there are some things that are bothering people. You know, we're seeing news reports, the CBC pointing out that the Alberta government is looking at selling off profitable registries and people are drawing lines to where donors are at and past relationships politically. And and some people might be upset with that. But then you also say, you know, policy, you know, things like ripping up a curriculum review or or or, or you know, tearing up a certain deal or, or rescinding a coal policy. You know, that's a bad example. But but on some things, uh, you know, uh, the same government under different leadership or a new version of that government or a different government entirely can always walk back some policies. And then there are things that you can never walk back. And that's why I think a lot of people are sounding the alarm on this one. You know, once you lop the top off the Rocky Mountains, the tops are lopped off. Yeah. So my my Ph.D. research is in restoration ecology. Um, and I've worked on this topic, you know, in a lot of different ways. We're not talking about restoration that's sprinkling some grass seed around and calling it good, right? We're talking about blowing the tops off mountains and contaminating rivers where that kind of contamination, selenium, can last for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it does everything from, you know, affecting, affecting the face, the uh, facial deformities and spinal deformities of trout to affecting their reproduction. This is the water that people drink. 1.4 million people in Edmonton get their drinking water from the North Saskatchewan River. These are the headwaters that I'm talking about. These are the places that are gonna be affected. Restoration like this, you know, it, it, even, you're right, even before the coal mining starts, there's roads that are being built. And we know a ton about how roads affect wildlife, including things like grizzly bears, bighorn sheep, mountain goat, elk, and certainly fish. These are really big issues and, and the work that's being done already, and remember this is with zero public consultation, zero consultation with indigenous communities. This is a really big deal already. It has to stop. So, you know, you take a look at the area. I, I think back to, I'm trying to figure out how I want to ask you this question because it's, it's kind of like more of a concept as opposed to a focused question. But you remember when the NDP was in government in Alberta and they were talking about a, a park in, in this part of the province and the official opposition was was pushing back intensely on this. And I think that that's becoming evident to a lot of people or has become evident as to maybe why the United Conservatives were so against uh, ensuring that this became protected parkland. But why to why the organization that you work for was prominently speaking at that time and was being painted as a foreign funded special interest group with 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 anti Alberta, a bigger picture, let me say, a bigger picture vision that would threaten the sovereignty of Alberta and Canada's parkland, et cetera. You, I don't need to get into this too much with you. I'm sure that you experienced it firsthand. I'm sure that you remember it. So to all the people that oh, yeah. may see this interview right now that are going to write this off like you're some lunatic fringe environmentalist that wants to take the sign, you know, you, you want to interfere with the sovereignty of parks. Of course, you're anti-business, you're anti-conservative, probably you're anti-oil. You know, you, you probably follow Greta Thunberg on Twitter. I bet you follow a bunch of crazy socialists as well. What would you say to the people that are going to watch this interview? <laughs> Yeah, I do remember that, you know, and one of the thing, one of the reasons that at, as a scientist, as a conservation biologist, I was so concerned about the bighorn in particular is because I knew the research that we had, we just published a couple of weeks ago. And I saw in those maps that the bighorn stands out as one of the most important places across this entire country for its combination of water and recreation. And as well, I know how important that is for wildlife. You know, these, these are big issues that lots and lots of people care about. And of, it is crucial to have a big picture vision here. These are, these are issues of national and international concern, right? 
we have to be thinking about that on a bigger picture. And I, my fam, my mom's family is from Alberta for multiple generations. You know, they're ranchers, farmers, they're people, I, my family works in the energy industry. These are difficult conversations that we need to have. And it's hard. A lot of people are hurting in Alberta right now. And that's one of the reasons we need to have really serious consultation. What kind of future do people want? Right? I think and it can't just be this whack-a-mole kind of thing of like, oh, here are mine and we're all going to rush over here. Oh, here's another mine. We're all going to rush over here. We have to have these discussions informed by evidence, God forbid, and then also have, have really important discussions with people. So, so I think it's really crucial that people know how important this, that, those places and the Eastern Slopes as a whole are for the whole country. People in Saskatchewan, people in Manitoba should be paying attention to this too. This is not just an Albertan issue. Well, that's my thing is I, I think that we need to have conversations like, you know, somebody yesterday, th this guy's coming at me like, you know, why am I anti-Alberta? Why am I anti, why, why do I want to bury the Canadian economy? All, all these types of things. And, and it's really like the sort of the inflammatory pigeonholing of people um, is, is really quite strange. But I would suggest that the loudest voices on this conversation or specifically around coal mining in the Rockies on the Eastern Slopes, the loudest voices have been, I mean, aside from the country singers, uh, have been the ranchers and the farmers and the indigenous, the First Nations, the uh, indigenous communities that are stepping up uh, protesting this. Uh, nobody's going to care more about it than them. Uh, they know how precious their water is. So, so it, it, it makes the conversation quite interesting because, you know, to speak very generally, uh, at risk of inaccuracy and at risk of perpetuating inaccuracy, very generally, you're talking about the conservative base, you're talking about rural uh, dwellers, ranchers, farmers. I mean, these are typically the people that are all blue all the time, which kind of layers on some complexity to where the public conversation is right now. Yeah. And what I think is important to, to know here is that people didn't vote for, you know, for for rescinding the coal policy. No, this didn't come with any right with it. Nobody knew this is going to happen, maybe except the, maybe except coal mining companies. So that's part of this huge problem. There's been zero public consultation on this. And yet when the, the 1976 coal policy was put in place, it was after years and years of careful discussion with people about what kind of future do we want to have. And they identified then, this is Premier Lougheed's government, identified how important it is for water, for cultural reasons, for recreation. They knew what kind of, that we would have to protect this most important resource. Water is our most precious resource. And it is going to become even more precious in the future. I don't know if people uh, spend a lot of time looking at uh, climate change modeling and maps about predicting the future. I do. We've got a lot coming. Okay, well, hang on, and doctor, because you actually sent us, Sam, don't show it yet. Um, you sent us a, a map, a graphic that's really striking in the context of climate change. We're going to get to that in just a second. We're talking to Dr. Aaron Jacob. Uh, right now, wanted to take a quick break to remind you that if all this talk about environmental responsibility and sustainability and, uh, hey, the sun shining on your face is resonating with you. Check out Kubi Energy. We're really proud to be partnering with Kubi Tesla certified solar installers. They only employ certified journeyman installers, which means that no matter where you are in BC or Alberta, when you call on them to cover your residential or commercial assignment, they're doing it with people that know what they're doing, certified tradespeople in Western Canada. Plus, they handle all the paperwork for you, the permitting, the, the reimbursements in some circumstances, little top-ups like from the city of Edmonton, 4K right now if you add solar to your house, kubienergy.ca. And don't forget to send us your positive reflections to talk at ryanjesperson.com. It's how we start every Monday on a positive foot with Kubi Energy. You also probably want to take care of your waste responsibly, right? And that includes a plan for waste removal and recycling. Local waste has been in that game for a quarter century here in Western Canada. Family owned and operated and they want your business. They love to talk trash. You can contact them directly at localwaste.ca. Follow the link under the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Dr. Aaron Jacob is our guest. Uh, a, uh, a conservation... I got to tell you, I've been... Uh, working in broadcast media for 15 years and when I'm having a conversation with a conservation scientist it twists me up like a pretzel anyway <laughs> that's who you are with Y2Y initiative <laughs> uh, you've done a whole bunch of research you've been kind enough to share some of that with us and, and by us I mean our real talk audience Sam let's take a look at that map that we just received moments ago from Dr. Jacob tell us what we're seeing here in the context of climate change what does this show us yeah. it, it looks like a hellscape but what is this <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you're not far off. You know, so this is modeling that's been done by the, the Climate Change Atlas of Canada. And this is a group of academics, of government scientists who have taken, who do climate change science and modeling and storytelling to really hit home to people. This is what we're looking at. This is what's at stake. And there's a lot of ways that you can measure um, global environmental change, climate change. One of them is the number of very hot days, and that stays over 30 degrees Celsius per year. And with what we're on schedule for right now, we're, that's what the future we're looking at. So five and a half times more very hot days per year. And that might sound nice. You know, we might set, think like, oh, I really want to go and sit by the, sit by the lake, right. you know, go fishing, right? Maybe not in mycelinium um, contaminated rivers. Uh, but this is why we have to be thinking about the eastern slopes and water, because this shows just how hot it's going to be getting out into the prairies in southern Alberta and central Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. This is why people all across the country should be paying attention to this issue about coal mining in the eastern slopes, because the water that falls in these mountains runs through the foothills and, the rib and those rivers goes all the way across the prairies. It's used for ranching, farming people's drinking water. It's already used for industrial purposes. It's not like there's extra water coming that we're going to be able to use for things like washing coal. People okay, might so not know just how much water is needed for coal mining. It's yeah, shocking. We had, uh, we had a listener uh, writing in, and we verified who they were, but writing in the alias of CJ that provided some some modeling with regards to uh, uh, trout populations. It was bull trout. Sam, do you remember? Was it cutthroat and bull? Anyway, it was. I don't remember specifically. I think it was cutthroat and bull. Anyway, really uh, enlightening map and some great commentary, and, and I screwed something up, which now gives me a chance to clarify. But but I had suggested that, that the mining the coal would release the selenium into the water, which could crust uh, over over the bottom of the sand and make it difficult for trout to they don't lay eggs do they whatever deposit their eggs anyway yep. cj followed up to say actually jespo you kind of put misinformation said said that can actually happen as a result of washing coal and, I, and i'm reading this and i'm going what and then i went and i'm googling it i'm trying to educate myself and when they're washing coal using our fresh water what it's just i mean hey i will say this aaron we're learning way more now uh, not maybe not you but those of us that barely passed grade 12 biology, uh, you know, we're learning way more now than we have in a long time educating ourselves about this. If there's any benefit to this, it's lit a fire under a few of us. It sure has. And there's so much information that's already known about these places. You know, there's lots of things that scientists don't know about the world. And that's one of the wonderful things about being a scientist. Mm -hmm. But we know a ton about this. We know a ton about the eastern slopes, about why they're so important for ecological connectivity about where the water comes from. This is, we know a lot about this already and we have to be using that information to make good decisions. And that's not decisions that are made at you know five o'clock on the Friday of a long weekend with zero public consultation. Where does the evidence go into making these kind of decisions? Evidence that keeps us safe. So Aaron, I, I was, uh, I'm, I'm part of this uh, kind of a group chat with some engaged, uh, you know, some politicians or internet chiefs of staff strategists. So it's, it's interesting. You get an interesting lens. You see things through an interesting lens on policy and, and, and they tend to be sort of, uh, they steer clear of partisanship and try to take on the issue. So it's fascinating and I benefit from it. Point is a very reasonable and smart member of this group chat uh, was not buying into to the rage and fury that I was breathing around this. And he simply said, what this is, is a great time for us all to evaluate our consumption habits and the fact that everybody wants big new SUVs and everybody wants to, you know, you know, fly around on planes and all of this requires steel and steel requires metallurgical coal and and Alberta has an abundance of that and you can only get it from so many places and we can only kickstart the economy in so many ways. So A to B, you know, Jespo, because you're driving a big SUV, it's partially your fault that they're coal mining in the eastern slopes. Uh, the provincial government ha has made a somewhat of a similar argument saying, hey, listen, there's a real demand for this. Uh, we're not burning coal for energy. They're using it for steel. Uh, Jason Kenney trying to channel Jim Prentice as best he can and remind people to look in the mirror if they don't like what they're seeing. So, you know, what what would you suggest? Are you going to say shut the whole thing down forever? No mining, no activity ever. Or are you somewhere in the middle or what are you pitching to the people? Yeah, you know, those kind of arguments just put the, they put the blame back on, on the individual, right? That we elect governments to make good decisions for us and we have to hold them accountable for those kind of things. So for, certainly we need to learn to live within nature's limits. We have one planet, right? That's reality. And some of the uncomfortable truths about science show exactly what's at stake here. But really these are government level decisions. And as voters, we should be calling our M MLAs 
writing to them. Don't stop. I know it's scary sometimes to pick up the phone and call them. It's actually a lot easier than you might think it is. And we need to tell them you got to re like reinstate the coal policy. We also want broader land use planning. So we're not forced to make these kind of decisions, you know, or, and as well, we need more parks and protected areas. Albertans need these things, especially in this last year. We've seen how important that is. So they, we're, in, we're in difficult situations. And that's why people run for office, to make these kind of hard decisions. So as voters, we need to be holding them accountable for a kind of future that keeps us safe, keeps the kind of things that we care about, like fresh water, clean air to breathe, wonderful places to recreate, and wildlife that people come from around the world to see that supports our economy, we need to be making those kind of decisions. That's what's at stake here. Dr. Aaron Jacob, a, a conservation scientist at Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative, the Y2Y Initiative. Really grateful that you spent some time with us on this Friday. Thank you for your advocacy, and, and maybe we'll cross paths on a hiking trail someday. Who knows? My pleasure. We can go fly fishing together. Yeah. Oh, oh I need to learn. Thanks, Aaron. I appreciate <laughs> that. I'm a I'm a lowly spin caster, so I I do what I can. But but like I I confessed, I made a confession on the show the other day and told everybody that I hike with a pack that's heavier than anybody else's because I carry things like tartar sauce. So you know you can't take. I know. I know. How do you feel about that? By the way. That's fantastic. I can't wait until okay. you know, until we're all vaccinated and we can go hiking together. Okay. Great. Okay. There you go. Yeah. We got to get rid of whirling disease and all that other stuff too, so we can eat these fish. <laughs> anyway, Dr. Aaron Jacob of Y2Y, we appreciate it. Uh, conversations like this are made possible because of our amazing sponsors. Did you see, by the way, Sam, that tweet? You see that tweet? I retweeted it this morning. I want to find it because I want to give this person a shout out. I absolutely love this. Uh, they reached out and they said, uh, you know, typically I skip advertisements. When I'm consuming media, you know, people PVR and they skip ahead as best they can. I'm going to find this. I love this. Um, <laughs> the person's name on Twitter is Petey stays home and wears a mask. So to Petey who stays home and wears a mask. Good on uh, you, Petey. Good on you, Petey. Says, uh, he tweets and says, you know, I usually ignore advertising almost on principle. Uh, radio, TV, the interweb. Says, but to those businesses supporting Ryan Jesperson in real talk, I tell you, I'm noticing who you are. Good job. And 109 people have liked it. 11 people have retweeted a tweet about advertising. Advertising works. The question is, who gets mentioned first after such a ringing endorsement of the value of these spots? Oh, my. I'm going to go with a guy that's been to the wall with me and back. Scott Held, who owns Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge. They're your home in Alberta for the Jeep lineup that looks better than ever before for 2021. Uh, including, I mean, their Rubicon lineup is unbelievable. They've got that Gladiator that everybody loves. And then, of course, the Grand Cherokee I'm driving. I think bang for buck. Uh, the best value SUV on the market. That Grand Wagoneer is coming out this year. I'm already kind of getting in Scott's ear. I'm like, you know, if you need somebody to test drive these Grand Wagoneers, I'd be happy to step up at your service. You'll find that brand new dealership in St. Albert beautiful in Sherwood Dodge as well. Plus, Clean Air Club. They do us the favor of knowing that we can breathe easy here in the Real Talk studio. They audited the space for us, made their recommendations and put them into place. It's what they do for you as well. Cleanairclub.ca, they handle your furnace filters. There's no more quick, easy, and affordable step you can take to breathe easier in your home. Think of your family. Think of it as you lie awake at night, what you're breathing in. When's the last time you changed your filter? They've got you covered with a schedule and doorstop delivery at cleanairclub.ca. Let's take a look at what's making news this morning. Of course, there's a lot going on in, in Ottawa. Uh, somewhat of a surprise or not at all. Governor General, now former Governor General Julie Payette, of course, formerly a Canadian astronaut, uh, wrapping up her almost 30 years of public service by resigning uh, from the post following a conversation with the Prime Minister. There had been widely circulated, I mean, the worst kept secret in Ottawa, and that's saying something, uh, widely circulated rumors that she was abusive to staff, berating them, belittling them. Uh, by way of a statement yesterday, uh, former Governor General Payette, quote, everyone has a right to a healthy and safe work environment at all times under all circumstances. It appears this was not always the case at the office of the Secretary to the Governor General. Tensions have arisen at Rideau Hall. For that, I'm sorry. She says, while no formal complaints or official grievances were made during my tenure, I still take the allegations very seriously. Julie Payette is out. What does this mean for the Prime Minister? What does this mean for Justin Trudeau, who put her there? A lot of people are saying, 
in retrospect, hindsight's 2020, but she was a bad choice from the very beginning. We're going to get into that on Monday. We've got a few asks out. We're going for the real insiders, and we promise. I'm going to go on the record and say I promise you we're going to deliver with a good interview on Monday about that. Alberta reports this by the CBC's Michelle Belfontaine considering selling off its profitable land titles, corporate, and personal properties registries to a private company. They're profitable. Alberta's in the tank right now economically. Why are we selling what's profiting? What's profitable? What is going on right now? Well, follow the money. It's unbelievable what's going on right here. Revenues for the three registries totaled over $123 million in the last fiscal year. Wellington Advocacy was contracted to convince Service Alberta about the benefits of alternative delivery here. The president and founder of Wellington Advocacy, Nick Kulsbergen, was the chief of staff to Jason Kenney when the UCP was in opposition. Kulsbergen also ran the UCP's election campaign back in 2019. So there you have it. All right, let's get into talking politics, but but I'm not talking in the way that, that makes your eyes glaze over. We're really ke- looking forward to this roundtable because it's the result of what you told us uh, resoundingly as part of our question of the week. Each and every week at RyanJesperson.com, right at the top of the page, we ask you to take our question of the week to take two, three minutes to answer it. It's presented by our official research and strategy partner, Y Station. We asked you on January 18th uh, for the week to go, we asked you uh, in the context of President Joe Biden's inauguration, you know, I mean, how or rather, pardon me, this one was about quality politics, the current one about Biden's inauguration. The quality politics one plays into the inauguration in the sense that we're seeing a transition of power in the U.S. from from the most controversial uh, president in American history by a mile, uh, President Donald Trump, back to what some people are describing stability, whether or not you think he's the best choice ever, Joe Biden represents a drastic change in the Oval Office. Here in Canada, we see division uh, in our uh, levels of government. We see a lack of bipartisan cooperation. At our city council level, we see some nastiness. We see pot shots. We're not sure that we're getting properly served. The quality of politics, generally speaking, demands to be improved. Or does it? That's the point of this conversation. And I'm looking forward now to welcoming to the program a member of parliament out of Edmonton, Wetaskiwin, the Honorable Mike Lake, a conservative MP. Mike is joined by a couple of his pals. And these, these, are, his, these are his, and they're not going to mind me describing them like this, I don't think, a couple of his drinking buddies. Because MP Lake hosts these Zoom happy hours. So Sarah Letursky is joining us, Connor Hall. I'm going to properly introduce them, give you some background to our panelists in just a moment. But let me welcome the three of you here. Mike, why don't you tell us how these Zoom happy hours got started? You've been doing them all through the pandemic and what your goal has been. Yeah, we've done uh, we've done about 30 of them so far. And, uh, you know, really, it comes out of, uh, you know, comes out of our mission statement, actually, as an office, which is, um, you know, first and foremost, obviously, taking care of our constituents and making sure that uh, that I'm representing them to the fullness of my ability. But then we we talk about the idea of having the most positive impact we can have with the largest number of people on wherever our platform gives us that opportunity. And of course, we've done a lot of work on the autism front and disability front, and I've done a lot of work on international development. But we, uh, you know, been been listening and 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 watching, like all have uh, the the state of politics down south. Uh, you know, look, looking at the parallels up here, um, and this need to find a different way to communicate with each other. This tribalism that is, I think, personally, a a threat to democracy where we're pushing everybody to the extremes and communicating from that point um, on all sides. And so I I happen after 15 years as a member of parliament to know know a lot of people uh, from around the world, uh, particularly in North America. And we thought, well, what if we bring together people with different political viewpoints and maybe no political view- viewpoints? Some of the, the folks that uh, uh, we brought into the conversations uh, aren't really inherently political to start with, but uh, um, but they care about people and they recognize. And I think fundamental to this is a recognition that political labels are constructs um, before we're conservatives or liberals or Democrats or Republicans, we're human beings. And so we need to communicate that way. And we put together these 90 minute Zoom happy hours with uh, with friends from around the world. Uh, we've got 200 people right now that we kind of rotate in. Uh, we do six, eight at a time and they've been fantastically successful. So 
Well, they've been a, they've been a whole lot of fun, and I've I've been uh, lucky enough to participate, and, and, and I love what you're doing. Uh, I want to get to our panelists here because uh, we've got an American, we've got a Canadian, we've got a Democrat, we've got a conservative. I mean, that's kind of the whole point of what you've been doing. Uh, Sarah Letursky is uh, prior to joining uh, Rubicon Strategy in her current role as a vice president. Uh, it's a, a GR firm, government relations, based out of Toronto. Sarah was uh, a chief of staff for a senior cabinet minister in Premier Doug Ford's government. Uh, Sarah, welcome to the show. When we talk about quality politics i don't want to make any assumptions here so when we say how do we return to quality politics or how do we infuse quality in politics we're kind of making an editorial statement that politics don't provide quality right now so do you even agree with the premise of the question that we asked our audience i do agree with the premise i think there may be some examples of quality politics that we've seen across the world um, but largely, I think we do have a problem with decency right now when it comes to communicating with not only, you know, our peers, but people across party lines. And, and that's something that I think in Ontario, when I was working for the Premier Ford government, we saw that as a problem. And uh, Premier Ford actually did a good job coming out of the federal election to play a bit of Captain Canada. And he tried to create um, unity across the provinces with a government that that was liberal at the federal level and, while he was conservative. And was he successful in that? I think to a degree. Um, but but largely we have a lot of work to do still. So can I before we go any further, Doug Ford, I I don't mean disrespect in asking this question, but I think. A lot of people, especially maybe people outside of Toronto, sort of saw him and his brother to a certain degree as a bit of a clown show for a while. Uh, when he ran for the leadership of the Ontario PCs, not a lot. Of, I mean, I, I won't say that not he won, but some people didn't take him seriously. And then you look at his performance through this pandemic. Even the other day, I showed video of him talking about, uh, you know, get, what did he say? Getting up the Pfizer CEO's yin yang with a firecracker to get him going on the back. And I just thought. I thought love him or, or or loathe his policy. I admired how Doug Ford has has manifested that persona of of the people's leader. And he's he's started to demonstrate, I think, I guess what I'm saying is I think that he's changed a lot of people's mind. Not everybody agrees with what he's doing. Not everybody is celebrating his his handling of the pandemic. He's a politician after all. But he's really transformed a lot of the or convinced a lot of the public opinion to change. Have you noticed the same thing having worked with him? I do. And I have a lot of friends who have reached out to me throughout this pandemic who have actually said, hey, look, I'm sorry about how I perceived your job or I said things to you maybe about what work you were doing um, a couple of years back because they saw that the premier is doing what a premier should. He's representing all kinds of people across the province and and he's serving a common goal, which is was just fighting COVID-19 and trying to support everyone who's been hurt by this deadly pandemic, whether that's through loss of work or a loss of loved ones. It's, it's a really trying time. And I think what the premier has done is he's, he's entered in the living rooms in a virtual sense every day at one o'clock for many months and provided an update and a steady hand to the people of Ontario. And I think other provinces as well are looking to him as, as a, as a leader who has been able to, to provide a sense of, of, of leadership across the country and, and, and support and hope that people have been desperately looking for. Connor Hall hails from the beautiful state of Colorado, uh, where he served as director of external affairs. There's nothing like flying into the Denver airport. I'm just always like, wow. Uh, uh, formerly a uh, director like of external that. affairs and uh, senior advisor to former Democratic governor, who's now in a, a U.S. senator, John Hickenlooper, before joining the Trust for Public Lands, one of America's largest environmental nonprofits, uh, where Connor holds a senior director role. Thanks so much for joining us. Welcome to, to I, I guess it's an international broadcast, isn't it? You make it so today uh plus no borders on youtube but when we talk about quality politics boy oh boy is there a lot to talk about in your home country <laughs> yeah no kidding uh, and, and it is so great to be with you guys today uh, i'm honored to be the neighbor from down south that you brought you know aboard this show and uh you're right it's 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 a really interesting time in american politics and you know really for me when you when this this question of quality politics, um, 
it comes down to a few things, but first and foremost is just the willingness and ability to listen to other folks um, and, and do that genuinely. And I cut my teeth um, in politics working on the 08 Obama campaign, fresh out of high school uh, down in Texas. And I was um, going door to door fundraising, get people registered to vote. Um, and as you can imagine, doing that in uh you know, Texas, in some cases, rural Texas was, uh, you know, it was, it was a tough political environment to be doing that work. And, um, you know, had multiple guns pulled on me. I got, you know, back of my leg got a chunk taken out by dogs. I mean, it was just, there was a lot of tough stories, but the, the, you know, my real takeaway, my, my, you know, lesson and in, in entrance into politics was, you know, around just meeting people where they were at. And this was before it was targeted. So I was, I was knocking on every door, and, and it was all about listening. I mean, we, we, you know, I threw the script out immediately of what you were supposed to say. And, and really it was about knowing enough to be able to respond to whatever that person really deeply cared about. And then taking the time and showing up in a genuine, respectful way to, to figure out what that was. Um, and, and, and we had a running, you know, and my twin brother and I both were doing this work in Texas and uh, we had this competition of who could get more Republicans to to give to Barack Obama, uh, the campaign, and and but 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 that was what it was all about, and it was that you know willingness to listen and and, and knowledge of, of of really knowing to be able to speak to what people cared about. And when I met Mike, you know, I think five six years ago now, in, in 2016, you know, we were in, it, you know, Hillary was was running against Trump. We were in this divisive election, uh, John Hickenlooper, you know, who I worked for still at the time was being vetted to be Hillary's VP. He would ultimately finish final three, but we were deep in that process. And it was just every day, it was just such divisiveness. And so meeting Mike was just this breath of fresh air. Um, and he was, and he had the knowledge to speak, you know, on most issues and the willingness, most importantly, to, to listen. Uh, and in a respectful way and engage in a, in a genuine way. And so that's why I'm so excited to be part of these happy hours because, you know, they come out of Mike's you know mind and that, that genuineness to engage. And it's, it's, it's a pretty incredible thing. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it goes a long way in, in this day and age of politics. Connor, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you a little later on in this, in this interview about working for an environmental nonprofit environmental lobby and, and influencing policy. I mean, before I spoke to the three of you, we were talking to a, a conservation scientist who's talking about coal mining in the Canadian Rockies, lack of government consultation. There's a lot going on. Um, Mike, I want to I want to put this in front of you because this this is from Mayor Blaine who's watching. I'll acknowledge uh, Blaine's uh, tweet arrives just 11 minutes into our conversation. I've barely just introduced the three of you and, and we haven't even talked to our to our so-called civilians like like CFL all time legend Adarius Bowman, uh, who, who who's kind of. I mean, aside from being a star athlete, one of the greatest of all time on the football field, he's just a guy. He'll tell you he's just a guy. And I want to ask him how he got involved in the happy hours and why politics floats his boat now when it didn't before. But I digress. Mayor Blaine chiming in says, I'm sorry. True Canadian fashion. He apologizes right out of the gates. He says, I'm sorry. But the discussion on Jesperson right now about the quality of politics is not talking about the real issue. He says the quality of people in politics we don't expect enough. I don't understand why it doesn't matter more. Connor just kind of talked about addressing cynicism at the doors and proving you can deliver, Mike. How much of a priority is that to you? And and what does the Conservative Party do? I mean, in your caucus meetings, when you talk about attracting solid candidates that will really deliver for constituents, what do those conversations look like? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, so first off, I think it's important to recognize that in a democracy I'm just an extension of my, and I serve the the largest riding in the country by population, about 200,000 people. I'm an extension of them. They can't all go to Ottawa, so I go on their behalf. And it's really important that as we have a conversation about tone and and um, and how we debate these things, that that conversation needs to extend to all of us, um, how we communicate on social media. And I'm constantly chatting with my conservative friends about the need to be more respectful in our tone. If you're if you're calling in Canada, if you're calling Justin Trudeau names, and I won't name them, but some of your listeners might have seen them on social media, ask yourself, are you winning one of those people? We need to win over probably a million people at least who voted for Trudeau last time. 
are you changing their minds with that tweet you're sending out or that comment you're making on social media? So I do think we we all need to up our game. I think one of the, the, the dangers of where we are right now in the level of political discourse is the fact that um, people, if you if you scroll through my Facebook feed, for example, and take a look at the comments uh, in my Facebook feed, it will absolutely inoculate you from any desire to uh, run for politics. You will absolutely not want to run for politics if you take a look through that. And and I sense that when I'm having conversations with fantastic people who I think would make great members of parliament is they see what's going on. And it's not just in the Conservative Party, it's in all parties. It uh, it, it, it really is a, a, a drag on getting good people into politics. Because Sarah... We, have, we absolutely have to up our game. Yeah, and Sarah, doesn't that... I mean, then don't the bad guys win? I mean, if the practitioners of the nastiest politics are chasing away people that could give them a run for their money and infuse quality, then the bad guys win. So how do you turn the tide? It's a huge question. I mean, we're trying, this is exactly what we're trying to do with this right now. But the question is, as we, you know, I mentioned that we've got sort of 200 people right now that are part of this orbit. And they're all people that I know personally, they're friends of mine who I think people need to hear more from. We're looking to expand that. We'd love to get from 200 to 2000 in the orbit in these conversations. But how do we take the conversations that we're having around people who are kind of like-minded and respectful in the tone and whatever it might be, how do we take that and then um, at scale have those same conversations with with everybody else? You come on right? Real and Talk. It's part of what you're doing. I was going to say that it's part of what you're doing. But but Ryan, I, you know, I've seen the demographics of your show and, and you've got a great following, but most of them are interested in politics already. And they're already kind of following politics. That's so fair. We have, to, we have to find ways to engage. I, this week, in addition to the, the Zoom happy hours that will run um, this two week span, I'm doing five two-hour Zoom roundtables with my constituents. And uh, anybody can come. We usually do 16, 20 people and talk about issues. And uh, and I think you kind of got to, you, you just got to be dedicated to it and you got to get creative in how you're doing it. But I think we we all need to up our game. Yeah, I'm read a quote. I'm a huge Dan Carlin fan. I'm just going to read a quote that I got from his podcast the other day. He was quoting Eisenhower and just very short. The middle of the road is all of the usable surface. Yeah. The extremes left and right are in the gutters and you know we've got to change the tone and the way that we, we talk i'll spare everybody from my matthew mcconaughey impression but he talked about the armadillo who's all safe now um especially with an american on the call i'm not even going to try it to talk to, <laughs> to emulate a texas accent here but he talked about how the armadillos in the middle of the road are super safe right now in the political metaphor because nobody's driving there um sarah how do you make that happen how, how do you draw quality to Paul, people and, and mike makes a great point it's i mean not everybody watching this show uh, or listening to the podcast is politically engaged but mike's absolutely Absolutely bang on. Most of them are. So how do you draw people, especially people facing barriers like like socioeconomic barriers? If you look at ethnic representation in politics, it, it, it needs to be improved. The gender parity needs to be improved. I mean, you know, even our city council here in Edmonton, I look two female city councilors. We've had one female mayor in Edmonton's history. Uh, Sarah, how do you begin to address that? Yeah, I think one of the challenges is that people in those uh, areas that you mentioned don't necessarily see their representatives reflect who they are. And so what I think a lot of parties need to start doing is looking for opportunities to get people engaged through volunteering, through conversations like Mike has done, talking about politics in a way that isn't debating the person and the individual, but debating the actual issue at hand. And you can debate either side of a topic without actually calling the person rude names and and at attacking them for who they are and the position that they have. It's it's coming from that common understanding that Connor was talking about. Um, I, I think of something that I often take with myself into conversations, especially Mike's roundtables, is we should all listen to understand and not to reply. And I think that that's a challenge that we have right now in politics is politicians are hearing, you know, opposition parties and all these other groups attack them for policies. And then they reply with their talking points in a pre-scripted answer instead of actually trying to maybe sit down with that politician behind closed doors and have a conversation with them or talk about kids or books or commonalities. And that's something that Mike does a really good job of in these roundtables and something that I then take into my other conversations with, with people across the aisle is we don't have to talk about politics right now. We can talk about books. We can talk about movies. We can talk about 
something funny that happened in the news. Um, we can talk about animals. We can talk about anything. And, and we, can, we can come to a common understanding that we're humans and that we may have different political views, but there's a role for us. And so as a, a young female staffer, it was really important for me when I was in conservative politics to still hang out with my friends that were maybe liberal staffers. It wasn't something that I wasn't allowed to do. It was something that I, I should have continued. And, and, you know, during COVID, it's a little bit difficult, but I try to check in with them every once in a while just to see how things are going. It's not good to constantly be in this echo chamber. You're learning nothing new and you're not actually furthering uh, your own debate if you're not understanding what the other side is saying. I'm uh, I'm scanning. I want to encourage the three of you and and the, the other panelists that are going to join us in 10 minutes or so to, to go back on this and, and watch the YouTube video of our talk and you'll see the live chat and it's amazing. I don't have time to read them all. Uh, there's a question for you, Sarah, on GR and, and who's doing government relations. I want to put that in, in front of you, but I also want I want, to, I, want, I want to return to our American friend here because, Connor, you, you do a lot of work. I mean, the, the group you work for now, Trust for Public Land, I, I was reading up on them. Obviously, you know, an enormous presence, like more than a million followers on social, blah, 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 all this kind of thing. You know, we're talking right now about, about environmental impact of, 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 of resource extraction, specifically coal mining in the Canadian Rockies. I don't need you to get it too into that. But what I want to talk to you about is ensuring that, that people's voices are heard to government, that consultation is meaningful. A lot of people right now have a stack of emails in front of me from people that say I voted conservative my whole life. I voted for this government, but I didn't vote for coal mining the Canadian Rockies, and I'm pissed that they didn't ask us about it. So when it comes to faith in government, trust in government, you work for an environmental group right now. What does that need to look like, and how does the general public need to perceive their voices are being heard? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, uh, and Ryan, and it really gets to the core of a lot of what we're talking about, which is, you know, people's you know, faith in, in government and good government. And I think we've taken some real hits down in the States uh, with, you know, the, the previous administration. I don't think uh, efforts were always all that transparent um, in the public comments process, which is a process we use pretty heavily on the federal government side down here was, um, you know, sometimes scrapped entirely. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think, so, so, you know, part of it is, of, of course, most incumbent upon the government and your leaders in government and those people you elect. And I think another thing that we're all talking about right here is accountability. There has to be some true accountability uh, to the, you know, for these people. But it also relies to some degree on, on you know, the, the population and, and people staying civically engaged and having conversations like the conversations that we're having to, you know, gain perspective and open their minds and, you know, when I first met Mike, the first you know, conversation we were having was about, uh, you know, coal mining and, and resource extraction in Alberta and in his backyard. And I learned a ton from him about that. I mean, we were we started on two different sides of the issue. But by the end of the you know 45 minutes we talked um, about this, we had really found some common ground. Um, and, and, you know, I think, it, it, again, when you can take the time to listen and sit, You'll find that you know most people want good, clean air and water. That that's not what people are disagreeing on. It's it's a it's a discussion of, of how how best we get there and, and keeping the the big picture in mind too, um, and and trying to balance the you know the the good for the most amount of people. So so how's that for a, a, a rambling? No, uh, it's not. It's not your. It, we, we're, we call it exploratory <laughs> thought and expression, Connor. It's never rambling. Uh, Mike, we're keeping you here on the line into the next half hour. So so I'm going to ensure that I make the most out of my time here with Sarah before we uh, let her get back to her work as VP at Rubicon Strategy. But Sarah, we've got an interesting question here. You know, we 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 read about and and this is not limited to any one government. Um, but, you know, sole source contracts, nepotism is 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 evident everywhere. People wonder about ties to government government, government accessibility, the pay to play meetings. You look at the big fundraisers. Justin Trudeau's done big one. Every federal party leader does big ones. I, you know, for a lot of people, politics is just a realm that they're not. They wouldn't even know how to get started on seeking a nomination to become a candidate. I mean, they don't even know what when it comes to lobby, uh, when it comes to government relations, uh, Logic Kelly speaking is watching right now. Thank you, Logic Kelly, and says, "Hey, for Sarah, do you think GR firms, uh, GR government relations, could could look to hire people who may not have as strong of a background or connection to government and err on the side of relationships in general?" 
it's another angle of accessibility to government. What do you think of that question? I think that's a great point. And I think it's something that a lot of firms should look to do going forward, because at the end of the day, she's right. Government relations is about building relationships with government officials, and it's about presenting solutions to government problems. And so anybody can do that information online, emails and phone numbers for elected officials, as well as their staff is publicly available online, just takes a call to start to have a connection within government. And I think it's it's something that um, I'll definitely take back and talk to my team about because it's it's a way to also bring different perspectives to the government table that they're always looking for. Um, I, uh, I really appreciate uh, the two of you joining us, uh, Sarah and Connor, as mentioned, Mike's going to stick around, but, but thanks for taking time to chime in with us and, and really appreciate your insights on this. We wish you all the best moving forward in your endeavors. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Mike. Guys. Thank you all. Cheers. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Connor. So Mike Lake's going to hang tight. Sam's going to bring in our next guests. Uh, 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 Julie Anderson's the CEO of the Canadian Partnership for Women and Children's Health. And then Adarius Bowman will need no introduction for sports fans. Uh, he's one of the all-time great wide receivers in Canadian Football League history. Uh, remember the CFL's All-Decades team, you're going, this is still the roundtable on politics, right? Yeah, yeah. We're going to find out how and why Adarius got involved in the, the political happy hours and, and as a, a born and raised Tennessean, what he makes of his home country right now. And it's going to be a great conversation. Of course, these conversations happen because of our support, our amazing support from our partners like the team at Park Power. They're the ones that power our hashtag, Real Talk RJ, which is smoking this morning. We appreciate what you have to say about this. We just read Mayor Blaine's tweet. I want to get to more of yours, so keep them coming. Park Power, since 2013, has made a commitment to charities in, well, their own backyard right here in the province of Alberta. They donate 10% of their profits to nonprofits. Isn't that great? They're in the natural gas, electricity, and internet game. And you know you got to take your business somewhere, so why not take it to a friend of Real Talk, right? They've joined us on our journey. Plus, when you use the promo code 2021-REALTALK at parkpower.ca, whether it's a commercial or residential account, they're going to give you 70 bucks off your first bill. How great is that? Eden Landscaping wants to remind you that soon enough, my friends, the tulips and the daffodils will be popping up. You're going to be looking at your planting beds and going, we could do so much more with this space. If you want to maximize the potential of your front or backyard, regardless of your budget, Eden Landscaping wants to talk to you. They can have meetings over Zoom. They can check out your property by Google Earth, and they can help you come up with a plan from the planting boxes all the way up to the big, beautiful projects. Don't live with what your builder gave you. Maximize it with Eden Landscaping. You can find them under the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. That's where you can find Todd's Mechanical too. A shout out to Todd's Mechanical. I love the story of this guy. Worked in the oil patch for a long time. Wants to spend more time with his family, so he started up a small business as Edmonton's best plumbing and heating expert. Don't take my word for it. Check out his reviews online. His customers love him. When this weather drops like it is now and your furnace starts to make that weird noise, give Todd's Mechanical a call at 780-499-7598. Shout out to Todd's Mechanical. Let's get back to our panelists. We're talking about quality in politics. Uh, Mike Lake, a member of parliament for Edmonton, Wetaskiw, and joining us as is now Julia Anderson, the CEO for the Canadian Partnership for Women and Children's Health. At the heart of her work is a commitment to making the world a brighter place by championing bold, innovative, and even disruptive approaches to advancing the health and rights of women and girls around the world. Julia, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much. Excited to be here. And right now, CFL fans are going, that's a Darius Bowman, including the technical producer of this show, Sam Brooks, is losing his mind. A Darius Bowman was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee, graduated from the Oklahoma State. He's a proud cowboy, a member of the CFL's all-decade team, the Edmonton football team's all-time team. He's a Grey Cup champion, and he is the husband and father of three daughters, the president of Adarius for Autism. Adarius Bowman, welcome to Real Talk, and thanks for being here. Oh, man, it's an honor to be a part of it, man. 
So uh, we're going to let this conversation free flow. And I can see on Mike Lake's face that he wants to talk about how he got you in on these Zoom happy hours. But Darius, let me ask you first, uh, a star athlete, a Grey Cup champion. Some people are going to be going, what in the hell is this guy doing on a political panel? How did you get involved in all of this? How did politics wind up on your radar? And and how politically engaged would you describe yourself? Oh, man. Uh, First of all, we definitely have to give a lot of thanks to my brother, Mike. Uh, he's the reason that I'm being a, a part of this today. Uh, we, we went back since uh, 2011, I believe, and I think the autistic community kind of brought us together. And then from there, we started developing a relationship. And, and I, I joke with Mike all the time, telling him how uh, before him, I didn't really have a care for any politics or politicians or anything like that, because I thought they had no place to engage with. I know some people may not call me a regular citizen, but I am, you know, when I'm taking a pass off, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a civilian, you know, so up into Mike's relationship, I never had a, a sense of even caring because I thought they didn't relate to the, the day-to-day person. But uh, after years of just uh, getting to know him and, and watching his character, um, I'm honored to be a part of today's topic when you say uh, quality, quality real talk in politics. And uh, in terms of my engagement, I will say over the last six to eight months, uh, being a part of uh, Mike's happy hours, I definitely have I guess I've kind of went back to school. I've been doing my research to try to see exactly where it affects me as a person. You know, I've been a guy that I've only worked in Canada my whole life. And and these past few months, I've realized that those taxpaying dollars, they go somewhere. But, you know, being in that bubble of an athlete, sometimes we never really think about it, but we do have a place. Julia, you're doing uh, incredible work uh, when it comes to the the futures and, and as you say, making the world a brighter place for women and girls. When we talk about equity in politics or representation in politics, uh, in in some spheres, including in my reality here, the city that I live in, women are underrepresented in politics. How does the theme of our conversation, quality in politics, fit into your perspective with what you do at the Canadian Partnership for Women and Children's Health? Yeah, thanks for the question. I mean, I think quality politics really have to be a mirror, right? So when I travel around the world, I see a lot of places that they don't have democratic governance, you've got dictatorships, you've got all kinds of things. In a good, healthy democracy, what we want to see is a mirror of the population reflected in the politicians that we elect. And to me, the happy hours and sort of coming into this space is an opportunity to turn the mirror around and say, who's having the conversations, what are the conversations, and how can we mirror those back uh, up into our elected officials? I think what happens when when we initiate those types of engagements, when we teach people how to talk to each other, there's a natural path, I think, into a better representation on the side of government and decision makers. I know Mike makes a big effort to make sure that our group is really diverse, uh, both in political perspectives, but in other aspects as well. And I think at the Canadian Partnership for Women and Children's Health, that's what we're doing. We're trying to lift up leaders around the world to show up, to lead their communities, to lead their families in ways that are meaningful. And I think I get to bring a little a little of that flavor to all the happy hours and, and sort of in my engagements, but it's about something much bigger in my head for sure. Mike, has the, have, have the, has the inclusion of 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 let, how do I want to put this like like people outside of the like I would imagine that there's a certain bubble like when you're in Ottawa when you're on Parliament Hill or you come home and you're in your constituency office or you're meeting with donors or you're doing outreach or you're at that like so much of what you do Mike is is like the political machine right so what sort of an impact does it have on your politics and your perspective and and, and essentially what your mandate is when you have an opportunity to interact with civilians as part of these conversations. Yeah, I mean, it's it's critical to doing the job uh, as best we can. I mean, I, it, we, it is way too easy for us to get caught in that Ottawa bubble, as we call it, where the only people you talk to are political people, people who are working in politics or other members of parliament, and most often, even worse, in your own party only. And that can be the worst thing we can do. So, you know, the, the constituent roundtables are one thing. Um, this is kind of an extension of that because I can be my constituency, quite, quite frankly, from a political standpoint, isn't very diverse. Our country is more diverse politically than, than the constituency is. This is an opportunity for, for me to deliberately, and now us as a, as a group of people that are engaged in these things and have a stake in it, to deliberately make sure that we've got that diversity reflected that's so important. And, um, just to say a couple of words about the two you're seeing here, 
I mean, Julia leads an organization that was founded by our government when we were in government, but has continued to be amazing and do amazing work, a network of, I believe, over 100 world-leading organizations now. And they're a, a great example of an organization and network that can be big and yet not get bogged down in too much political stuff. Um, you know, really keeping their eye on the ball, which is a good segue, I guess, into uh, Adarius. Adarius is completely different. You know, we connected, we actually connected on a radio interview um, with my Jaden and myself and Adarius. I'd never met him before. And uh, we got talking about his work that uh, he did, did in his fashion for, for, for autism. And we've just become great friends ever since. And one of the things I say, we all have platforms. Not everybody's a CFL superstar, but uh, we all have platforms, every, what, every one of four, 40 million Canadians. And what we really want to do is encourage people to take that place they're at, the platform that they have wherever they are, and work to make a positive impact in uh, what they're doing. And if we can, you know, if someone like Adarius can lead the way and be an example with the maybe larger platform that he has, uh, it encourages other people to do the same. Adarius, was your, your connection to, to autism, uh, did that have anything to do with your uh, interest in, in becoming more politically engaged? Like, I can understand how that would connect you to Mike, uh, an issue that matters very deeply and very personally to both of you. But but ha has has that influenced, like, have you said, hey, listen, if I want to really move uh, your organization forward or your advocacy forward, you're going to need to play more in that political arena? I'm actually trying to steer clear of all the sports metaphors because they're too obvious. But 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 have you identified that in, or or does that drive your engagement? Oh, no, I definitely uh, I would agree with the terminology. I wouldn't use the word political engagement at first. But now that I've had my time to really like hone into what's really going on, I think it's very similar in some sense. How Mike just kind of said stepping outside of your bubble, you know, and if I wanted to be an advocate or someone to speak for the autistic community, I had to step outside my bubble and engage with the community. And like I say, be that regular civilian. And that's what I really enjoyed about it. You know, uh, at first, I think uh, the league, a lot of the guys might not understood. Why is Adarius doing that? I don't have autism. I didn't have a kid with autism, but I had a teammate, Brock Ralph, you know, and it was my time I spent with him. His oldest daughter, Oakley, is what made me want to step out there and really, you know, if, if she's the only kid I ever helped, that was my first initial thought. I'm down for that. And But it ended up being a, a snowball effect, and the whole league got behind me. And uh, I kind of show off my ring all the time. I don't wear a Grey Cup ring, but this was my uh, community service award, the Tom Pate Award in the CFL. And uh, – I actually was <laughs> given the privilege of having Mike Lake as my my plus two guest when we had that ceremony. And uh, and it was, uh, I tell people all the time, I don't really wear my Grey Cup ring, but I do wear this ring because I feel like, like you kind of said, that was when I kind of stepped outside my bubble and really made a change. And uh, all the guys that engaged with the Darius for Autism, it was amazing, which eventually led me to where we at now. And uh, how you and Mike just presented right there, uh, when we're in our bubble, we don't think that politics has a part on us. But once I've, like I say, once I've done my research, it does me, my family and everybody around us. And so I just looked at it as an opportunity to rebuild our communities and, and everybody, you know, nobody's greater than anybody. And let's, let's find a way to all use our platform and truly make a difference. And I think that is hands down the number one reason why I'm honored to be a part of Mike's happy hours because it allowed everyone to be their self. And uh, we, we get a, a lot of jokes and, and things like that. But it's, at the same time, there's no arguments and everybody's willing to, like, put their ego and pride and, you know, all those things to the side and really take on what we're trying to do. You know, and so back to, like, we started the topic of quality. And, and that's what I found in Mike as, as character and, and everybody that's attended worldwide, all his friends that I've connected with and now my friends. It's quality people. So I, I see why they're excelling at their profession. Well, and this is, I mean, this is kind of tight. That, that's the difference, by the way, between me and you. One of the differences, I think our, our 40 yard dash would probably be quite different. There's quite a few differences between you and I. One of them, I would wear a Grey Cup ring, I would wear it making eggs. I would wear it brushing my teeth. I would wear it shoveling the walk. I would, I would wear it everywhere all the time, and I would make sure everybody saw it. Um, but, Adarius, so, so here's the thing, and I promised the audience I would do this. This is so rude of me, and I very rarely would ever ask a guest if they have a political affiliation. But I'm curious to know, you are a proud son of Chattanooga, Tennessee. I don't know if you have, if, if, if you have a direct or vested interest in the Republicans or the Democrats. I'd be curious to know your insight on on your, your country you know I'm, 
obviously you're a proud Canadian too, but like in the United States right now, I think we can acknowledge that there is some healing to do. I mean, President Biden's entire address uh, was about unifying the country, healing the country. Um, When you survey the American political landscape right now, how does it make you feel and where do you see it going and and what's your personal perspective? Oh, man, my personal perspective is uh, I hope that, you know, we can't all get behind Biden and actually see the results, you know, of coming out of the four years that we did just have, you know, I think there's a, tons of room room for improvement but uh once again I, I i like to say uh i've been in canada for a while and uh, like i say over these last six to eight months i really honed down and thought about like how things are done down south versus up north you know and you know we kind of got it's right or left with us you know and i and i've kind of became a fan of the way that Canada canada kind of do it you know i'm not a politician politician but if i was I, I would lean more towards like my brother mike conservatives you know but in that way, it creates another voice. But for us right now in the U.S., man, we're just hoping and praying that like uh, everything can align and we can actually see results. And I think Biden's he's he's been in what two, three days now. I can say uh, my family's excited. I'm excited, you know, uh, just with some of the things that he's already said and presented. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can rebuild and, and actually see unity. You know, uh, being from America, you know, we get a bunch of those stereotypes and these different things from racism and gen- all these different topics that we're talking about daily around here. But uh, the one thing that I'm excited about, like I say, uh, I feel Biden's doing a great job of, you know, stepping up and addressing and bringing us together on, on all phases. Like once again, like I say, my family, I haven't seen my grandma and mom is as excited. I think it was when Obama did his first term, you know, they was very excited about it. But uh, like I say, Biden's someone that's worked with Obama but uh, yeah, it's a lot of rebuilding, and I think uh, I think we're in a great direction. But once again, like I say, uh, if we had a conservative party, I'd be over there. See, I see that, but this is what I love: complicated scenarios. I'm a very complicated person. If people say, people always try to say to me, like when they finally feel comfortable, they say. You know, I mean, like, really, like, who'd you vote? Just tell me who you voted. Who'd you vote for? Mike and I have had hilarious exchanges on this type of thing. Uh, Mike and I, you, I, I just want to tell people. So you, so you and I were talking the other day, and you go, yeah, you know, your show leans a little left, and I right away bristle, and I go, ah, uh-uh. ah. I go, no, there's just a bunch of prickly conservatives that won't grant me interviews. My show's not lit, and you and I kind of do that dance, and we have a lot of fun. But I love complicated scenarios like a Darius saying, I would run as a conservative in Canada, but I'm super excited about Joe Biden because it forces people to think. I mean, I want to get all three of you. We're going to dive into these stats here. Our research and strategy partner at Real Talk is Y Station, and they present our question of the week. 1,776 of you, an amazing number if you consider the theme of democracy 1776 of you responded to our question about quality in politics and some really interesting responses you saw three major problems real talkers by the numbers you see social media as the root of a lot of these evils you see the political party system as part of the problem the us versus them and you've suggested that we need better education starting earlier to create better citizens Sam, can we take a look at the graph? It's really interesting. It shows us where real talkers wind up here with regards to stopping the decline in the quality of politics. Look at the big numbers here. 71% of you, 71% of respondents said you demand more accountability from elected officials when they screw up or act in bad faith. 56% of you want to see more transparency mechanisms. 48% of you say we need more journalism and media outlets doing tempered and professional coverage of politics. That's fair. I'm happy to talk about that. And 45% of you said we need to find ways to get people involved in politics outside of political parties. I'm just going to snipe at a few of the, the comments that Real Talkers left here as part of the survey. You know, one says everything is so polarized. The, the parties need to work together. Even if they have a majority, they should be forced to still incorporate. They should be forced to still incorporate input from the other party instead of ideological motives alone. Another says we need to regulate social media platforms. Another says voting needs to be made mandatory. That's an interesting one. Why don't we go to the politician first on that? Mike, you think voting should be made mandatory? Uh, We're going to need a a whole other show to have all of uh, those conversations. I mean, there's there's challenges with mandatory voting in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of 
uh, engagement if you've got a certain number of people in your society that uh, that don't engage at all in the process or understanding the process and then you make it mandatory for them to vote what kind of impact does that have on the vote uh, that would be you know one aspect um, not a huge fan of, of mandatory voting the other things though um, that people are talking about are the, the very things that uh, that we're seized with I do want to say too I just want to quickly point out while I've got the floor here that uh, the highlight of our Zoom happy hours when Adarius is on is uh, when his kids come into the room. He's got three daughters. Your oldest of the three is two years old, right? Like, oh, you've wow. got three little daughters yeah. uh, and a brand new, like, how how many days ago? You've got a 2021 girl, don't you? Yeah, two weeks old. Oh, two weeks wow. Old. Yeah. yeah. So he doesn't have three yeah. girls running around, two girls running around, and yeah. uh, one doesn't run around yet but it's a it's a, a real highlight to see a Darius interact with his girls uh uh in the background so how does how does becoming a dad change your perspective on politics or is that something that's not really even been on your radar that's definitely on my radar like I say uh with me being American working to get my Canadian citizenship my daughters all three of them are Canadian born right here in Edmonton you know and so uh like I said once again I'm having to take on those thoughts and, and get myself together right now and and like you said I I definitely, you didn't ask me the question about mandatory voting, but I feel like before I agree with Mike, before getting there, it's educating. And that's what I'm hoping. Mike's done it for me. Julia, like uh, I think Connor and Sarah was on early and it's been tons of more. They're filling me up with the education now. So it, it, I feel like after I keep going down this, this journey and this path, I will feel more confident about when it comes time to vote. You know, I've been on and off with my years of doing it be, because of the lack of education, you know, and, but, once again, I, I'm hoping that not just me, but uh, the whole CFL and go all into America, all our professional sports. You know, we tend to have a bigger voice than what we know. And uh, this is very important because uh, your, your football career ends at some point. But like where are you from and the, the political aspects of things, it don't. You know, we'll grow old. I'm going to either be in Canada or America, you know. And so uh, it really locked me in more. Julia, we, we, I threw a whole bunch uh, in front of you three and our audience there with regards to, to what our survey uh, gleaned. I mean, obviously, almost 1,800 people. We've got a lot of data. We've got a lot of comments. But, but was there something in particular that jumped out at you there? I definitely want to talk about the relationship between politicians and the media, the relationship between media and the general public. And I want to have real talk about that. And I'm happy to get personal on that. But, Julia, what jumped out at you? Yeah, just on that, on media, I mean, I suggested at one of the Zoom happy hours, and it, it, I don't know if it received wide support, but that we should have like a website or a media time devoted to politicians getting along. I called it, we should have like the get along gang website, because what <laughs> I see, I do engage with a fair bit of pol politics and things. And what I see is often behind closed doors, when you're in conversation, when people feel, you know, secure that they can talk. We have more in common than we have that holds us apart, right? And people will say that, but it plays out in politics. That you know, laws are made because people negotiate and they engage with one another. Um, and I think the media and you know, social media for sure tends to really highlight uh, the negative when people are fighting. There's nothing like a good news clip about someone who's done something terrible to someone else or said inappropriate and unkind things online, right? But when people are getting along, when they're doing their jobs, when the Mike Lakes of, world, of the world are digging in and trying to get to the best answer for Canadians, that's often not highlighted. So I think there's lots broken on the inside, uh, but that's one thing that stuck out uh, for me. The other thing is the thread between all, all of those pieces is showing up with your interests, right? We're so forced in the social media world and in kind of quick in virtual engagement that we're all now uh, sort of forced into because of COVID to show up with our positions, right? So my position is this or this or that. Your interest is underneath there. Quick illustration, two seconds. You know, I go into the kitchen, my two kids are fighting over a lemon. It's the last lemon in the kitchen. And they're angry and they're fighting and they're driving me crazy. So I take the lemon, I throw it in the garbage. And I come or in the compost. And then I come back out and I say, well, what, what was the problem? Like, what did you both want a lemon for? And the one kid goes, well, I wanted to make muffins, so I needed the lemon rind. And the other kid goes, well, I want to make lemonade, so I needed the juice. Their interest in the <laughs> lemon, if they had just put it on the table, would have meant that one got lemonade and one got the lemon rind. But because they were fighting over the thing, their position 
being, I want the lemon, uh, their position was showing up, not their interest in it. It's a real, real quick illustration. You see that all the time where people come in really big with their position of this or that or the other thing. What's underneath that? What are the interests? And that's one thing I love about the conversations we have and the conversations I try to enable in my very large and complicated network of amazing organizations are around interest. Why are we trying to get to this? What do we want to get out of this conversation? Where do we need to get to? Let's start with the heart of the matter, not start with what are, you know, finely tuned positions that we've taken are. And the more we can see that in politics, the more we can mirror that in the population, learn how to have conversations that are real and are about why we're really showing up and what we want out of this and some of that vulnerability and all that stuff, uh, I think the better off we'll be. And, and the more we can push that up into the political sphere as well. If we want to see that getting along, we've got to ask for it. And we've got to be getting along ourselves. Is Did the lemon thing actually happen or is that like a King Solomon type? <laughs> did that actually happen or is that just a really great metaphor? It's a really great metaphor. But okay. I do have five children, so there's lots of real examples. But I was gonna, I was gonna say, if your, if your kids are fighting over fresh fruit because they want to bake and do healthy ha habits, I was just gonna say, we're gonna just extend this roundtable by an hour, and we're just gonna do parenting with yeah. Julia. Um. Yeah. So okay. So you Mike, can't get away with, you can't get away with anything on Real Talk. Julia, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. No. That's. What, I just thought that it. That is just. That is the best humble brag I've ever heard in my entire life. Um, but, uh, so Mike, so real talk, Mike, um, uh, you know, some people are right now are saying, you know, you know, I commend Mike Lake for doing all this kind of stuff. Other people are saying, you know, Mike Lake hasn't stepped up strong enough as, as my MP to criticize premier Jason Kenny right now. People want to put you, call you to the carpet on that. If we talk about relationships between media and politics, people will say, Oh, Jesperson, you're one to talk. You blow V8 every single day, blasting your hot air across Western Canada. Right. I guarantee you real talk, Mike, is that some of your colleagues within the Conservative Party of Canada are going to give you shit for even talking to me. So what about the relationship between media and politicians, between media and the public? How does that play into quality politics through your eyes? You know, we're, we're, we're human beings. I, you know, there's lots of things packed into that, that question, but uh, I can only wake up every day and make the very best decision I can make given whatever the circumstances of the day are. And, uh, and, you know, my decision this morning is to come on your show. That's my decision. And uh, I love it. I love the conversation that we're having uh, as it relates to relationships with media. Um, let's not lump everybody in. We use labels way too much. And to just say media it treats everybody as though they're all exactly the same. And, uh, you know, there are people in media who I wouldn't do this with. And there are people in media who I would. And, uh, you know, uh, really ultimately, I think about what it is that I want to accomplish with my 960 minutes that I'm awake every day. And uh, um, and this fits into that. Um, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes there's too much risk uh, in, in, in the conversation. As it relates to weighing in on provincial governments, I've, I've tried to make it a habit over time not to weigh in publicly on provincial governments across the country. I had a lot of opportunity to do, do so as it relates to autism with, uh, with different governments liberal and uh, conservative look at Ontario and I've made it a habit instead to say well how can I actually have impact and the way that I can actually have impact is to work on the relationships I have to try to have trusted conversations and give advice because I know a lot of people who I can direct decision makers to to help them to get to the, the best place might not always agree um, with with where the government's going but by way of example I worked with the win government to help them to make meaningful impact on on uh, their autism policy because I thought that was a better way forward than pounding them over it when they were having a tough time with it. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I just, the one other thing I just want to really reinforce is this idea of positions in our public discourse because um, Dan Carlin and Joe Rogan did a podcast a few years ago and I thought they nailed it. And this was like three years ago down there. They were having a conversation and something that struck me, they said, everybody, human beings, not, not politicians, Everybody now, you can't have a meaningful political conversation because everybody comes to the conversation with talking points. Regular people now are coming to every conversation with talking points and there's no room to, to listen and perhaps be persuaded of something anymore. And uh, I think that that's critical. Uh, you, you've heard almost every person in this last hour talk about the importance of listening. One of the things that's so valuable, probably the most valuable thing 
about the Zoom happy hours we do is when people from Canada talking about American politics get a chance to actually listen to people from the states who might come from different places and telling their stories. And uh, it gives a whole new perspective when we just take the time to listen to people. I want to read some of the tweets that we're seeing on our hashtag this morning, the Real Talk RJ hashtag uh, powered by Park Power. Adam Brown uh, says, you know, this current panel right now on Real Talk makes me think of that political blind date show, uh, which even figured uh, featured uh, Premier Doug Ford back in the day. If only question period was as productive as that show is Hayden bear is watching and says, uh, Hey, Hey Mike watching you on real talk. I'm loving the conversation so far. It's good to see a politician showing he cares and wanting to engage his constituents, regardless of party affiliation. I wish more politicians were like you. Thanks for having him on Jespo John. This is a really great question. Um, and, and, and I'm, and I certainly am going to provide an opportunity for Julian Adarius to provide some, some closing thoughts, but this kind of, this winds up right back in, in, in Mike Lake's, uh, here, John says, you know, I wonder how many, Good men and women uh, from all political parties are wrecked. He says wrecked. Why don't I say compromised um, by the leadership or by party agenda? You know, a lot of people probably get into politics thinking they can change the world and then they have a bit of a rude awakening when they got to toe the party line. Yeah, a, a little bit of sort of politics. I guess politics 101 from my perspective, my perspective, I think any MP, um, we're free to make whatever decisions we want in a parliamentary system. We are part of parties and we have caucus meetings that are confidential where we can really pound it out. The expectation is that you come out of caucus and you don't say what happened in caucus um, and uh, and you move forward. Um, sometimes you might have a publicly slightly different position than the party. And at times you might make a decision that, you know what, my party's not where I am. And we saw that, if you might remember back in uh, my predecessor in my old riding of Edmonton, Mill Woods, Beaumont was David Kilgore. And he made a decision within the parliamentary context that that didn't work for him. And of course, um, you know, we've made a decision as a party uh, in the in the last few days that some people like, some people don't like, but it's part of the, the parliamentary system we have. And just one last comment on that that's really important as we have this, this discussion. A lot of people will say, well, why can't you just work with the government and whatever the case is? It's important that we work, res communicate respectfully in everything that we do. But we also have to remember that our, our parliament, our democracy depends on an effective official opposition. It's literally our job as the opposition to ask really, really hard questions of the government. I've been on the government side answering those questions. I've been on the opposition side asking those questions. And our democracy is better the harder the questions. It's better, though, if those questions are respectfully put and at least if there's some effort to respond to those questions with information. So we always want to leave our audience, uh, and I always want to walk away from every show with with a takeaway. So, you know, I, this assignment editor that was hugely influential in me back in my early days as a cub reporter used to ask in the assignment meetings, why do people care? That's the only point of any story that's filed on any journalism outlet is why should people care? So, Adarius, when we, when we talk about the takeaway here, if we want to complete the pass, I can't help myself. Uh, what's the takeaway from this conversation on quality and politics? What are you taking away from what we talked about today? And what do you think that people should think about? Uh, what am I taking away from politics in this whole conversation today? Uh, like the title of what we're doing, quality, real talk. And I want to refer back to what Julia said. What's our interest? You know, what is our interest with, with whatever, you know, profession we're in, but we're talking about politics. What's your ultimate interest? And I, I'm hoping that, you know what I mean, uh, what got me here today is I admire the, the person Mike Lake is. I do respect and honor the position he's in as a professional, and, and I've even followed that even more. And I think at times, like I say, that character, the quality character aspect about him shows. You know, uh, I can't speak for myself, but I've going through my journey, I've had fans and other people tell me, Darius, man, you, you don't seem like an athlete. You don't. I think it goes back to how I was raised. You know, my mom was all about character, you know, and then once I got into athletics, I kind of had a coach tell me, like, character out trumps your talent. You know, I think it's probably very talented and smart people in politics, but, like, if we can sit our egos down, and, and, and I'm a stubborn person that time, but if you can sit all that down and, and actually listen and we find an ultimate interest, you know, maybe, you know, we can we can get somewhere in life and 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 – once again, like I say, uh, I'm, I'm full engaged now. I'm even, uh, 
I was talking to my wife early today, you know, I think a lot of talks have been about this Yellowstone, you know, the pipeline, you know, and one of our main reasons of coming back to Edmonton was, you know, my wife's an engineer, you know, and so not saying that makes or breaks us, but it just, it kind of, you know, I was just blind up into like the last few half Mm -hmm. a year or so, you know, about like that actually affects the decision at times, but I just wasn't locked in. So to try to sum it up and answer your question, like you kind of said, let's let's educate each other. You know, let's use our platforms. You, Ryan, Julia, Mike, myself, and, and Mike, whole team. You know, uh, I, I used to joke with Mike before getting to this point, you know, that, that place we had at the happy hour, you know, it, I was like looking forward to it so much. We was we was actually messing each other sometimes. And uh, I think uh, Andrew wrote an article about it. Like we was craving it and missing it, you know, especially with this year we just had, you know, with the COVID, you know, that was a place it was a physical place we can go, but like it was in my head and I was looking forward to it every Friday. I didn't make every show, but I was, I was waiting to get that email from Holly, you know, because uh, it was, it was doing all those things for me. It was, it was, it was, you know, just like football, you know, we, we, we always, somebody got to win or lose, you know, but our ultimate thing is to, to entertain the crowd and engage with the community. You know, I, I hope we can see more of that in politics rather than winning and losing all the time. So, uh, yeah, hopefully, like I say, unite and just can we all just get along, man. <laughs> Another shout out to Holly though, too. Thanks, oh, Adarius, yeah, because not. she's Always. watching. She will appreciate it. And these, yes. you know what it's like with with uh with we're a team. And this doesn't happen without Holly, who works for me in Ottawa, making all of the arrangements, building relationships with everybody yeah. that's a part of it. Yeah, Holly Fisher. She she certainly deserves recognition. Uh, Julia, uh, your takeaway. What are you taking away? What what do you want people to be thinking about today and moving forward? Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm a coalition girl. This is my life's career is to work in kind of small P politics and, and work with people from diverse perspectives. And I think the two, the two ingredients um, that are absolutely critical, not to overuse my food analogies, I'm avoiding the sports ones for the same reason, but uh, (laughs) yeah, the two main ingredients are, you've got to have a diversity of perspectives. If you're showing up and all saying the same thing, it's not helpful. And in order to manage diversity and people who disagree, you've got to learn the fine art of having conversations. And our politicians have to do that better. We as citizens have to do that better. We've got to get a a handle on social media and the way that that takes away from our ability to be in in good human connection and good human relationship and in conversation. Um, And it comes back to that interest in positions, but it's really all about those two things. Learn how to talk to your next door neighbor, just start there learn how to talk to the person across the street, expand out from there, or even your family members who disagree with you and make sure you're showing up in spaces just like we do on the Zoom happy hours. A huge credit to Mike for making it happen and for bringing us together with a whole lot of people who disagree with you, but be prepared to engage in a way that's based on that practice of being in good conversation. Uh, Yeah, so thanks for having me. So excited, learned a lot. And I'll be happy to be at the next Zoom happy hour. There you go. Well, 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 Mike Lake. Uh, you know, today here we've had it. It's we we wanted to, I, I suppose, create almost a microcosm of, of what you've been doing through the pandemic with these happy hours. So we've, you know, we've we've heard from a an Ontario uh, conservative chief of staff. We heard from American an American Democrat, former advisor and assistant to to a governor and a senator. We've heard from a star athlete. We've heard from the CEO of a of a group that works with government. We a conservative member of I mean this is great and it's kind of been the whole spirit of what you've been doing so one thing for us to walk with Mike that that also maybe something that I don't know if you had a moment of enlightenment this hour but but something you think we should consider on quality in politics what is it oh my gosh I uh just um this is gonna sound so oversimplistic but be kind like first and foremost there is no reason that in everything we do we can we can debate passionately and still be kind in the in the way that we do it. Um, you know, we can have conversations, we can participate in panels and and still be kind. It's not the opposite of hearty debate and um, disagreement. And and I think that that's absolutely critical. I'm full disclosure on the spirit in the spirit of Zoom Happy Hour. I'm drinking Bailey's and coffee. <laughs> and I, I like my Starbucks mugs. And I know this isn't meant to be the word that you see, but I've got it's my niece mug. But I picked it because it's nice. Play nice. And uh, yeah. um, and I specifically picked that today to remind me as we're having the conversation that this is what to me, this is what it's all about. 
I uh, really appreciate this. Uh, it, it, it's been uh, an enlightening hour, and, and I hope that we've given people something. that We knew that we weren't going to solve all the world's problems, but we wanted to address this question in meaningful fashion from a bunch of different perspectives. And it's been great to, to connect with, with Julia Anderson, with Darius Bowman, uh, with Mike Lake. Thank you to the three of you, and we wish you a wonderful weekend. Thanks for the real talk today. Thanks for doing this, Ryan. Ryan, I got a new title, too. I'm the American Conservative. Next time I'm on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But we want to, yeah, I'd rather call you the Biden conservative because then that'll really twist people up. Like you used to twist up defensive backs back in the day, right, D? Anyway, hey, we're going to look forward to seeing news coming up with, with what I, uh, seeing you apply your talents and, and everything going on. Anyway, I, d- I don't want to get too into it because I know you're a humble guy, but I really appreciate your availability, Julia, too, and Mike, of course. Thanks to the three of you. I love it. The Biden conservative. There we have it. Um, it's Friday, and you know how we're going to wrap up the show, obviously. We've got an amazing edition of Trash Talk coming up. But, but I've got a stack of messages here, and the, 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 the feedback uh, by way of our inbox at Real Talk, you, you, know, you type in talk at ryanjesperson.com, it emails Sam and I. You spent, uh, you said about an hour yesterday just sort of trying to tackle it. Yeah, it's about an hour yesterday. It's um, uh, it's it's a I monumental sort of, task. It is, and and it's like I I will say I I actually look at every email. I do every email. Yeah, that's, well, we that's might want to miss something. Absolutely, and and it's it's funny because there's sometimes that I sit down and I'm just like, okay, there's 50 talk emails lined up. I'm just gonna like sit and watch hockey and kind of thumb through these, and and all of a sudden there's a goal scored and I didn't even notice because I'm so. <laughs> into this email that See, I it's the down it's the real of. talkers yeah. so you you played it remarkable i noticed you you, you wore it you're looking very sharp today sam uh you wore the three piece uh you've got your tie tied nicely not even with the top you haven't even popped your, your button um is that did that have anything to do with the fact that you were going to be interacting with an all decade CFLer, an all time Edmonton wide receiver, a Grey Cup champion, one of your favorite athletes of all time, Adarius Bowman? I, I mean, I probably would have worn my jersey if I actually wanted to be pandering. <laughs> you know, uh, if, if we're getting if we're getting real talk there. No, I um, I kind of said this to you off mic before. Is like back when I worked at the Journal, I used to dress like this every day, and I just feel comfortable in it. And so, so, how was your how what were your yeah. thoughts on Adarius Bowman? I liked him. Uh, I, I he's a he's a compassionate, community focused person first. Yeah, and and then politics kind of creeps into that second. And I think that that was a very common theme among everybody that we talked to today. Too, it, it's like you know, I, as per usual, I have yeah. notes. From well, I, the show. you know what I loved what he and, said is he yeah. goes he goes if I was in Canada, he says if I were to seek office, I would do so as a conservative. He says, but I'm really excited about Joe Biden and my family is too, and what we think he can do. That does that's me. Like I'm I'm people will say to me like I I said it's not a joke. I've got the question a thousand times. People go just tell me, like who do you like are, are you a member of who do you vote for? And I go I'm not. It's not that simple for me. I can yeah. be inspired by, uh, I mean, uh, uh, 100%, absolutely, without a doubt, if I was an American casting a ballot, I would have been voting for Joe Biden against Donald Trump. <laughs> if, if I needed to state that, I'll go on the record there. But not every federal election in Canada, not every provincial election in Alberta, and certainly not any municipal election has ever been that simple for me. You're a rare me. breed. You're one of the true swing voters. I am a swing voter. Yeah. Absolutely. Would you care? Are you a swing voter? Um, or are you I, pretty tri? I don't want to say tribal because it's inherently negative. But yeah, I wouldn't call me a, a, a tribal person. I mean, I, I definitely check into issues a bit. Uh, I'm a bit of a strategic voter, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, you know, especially especially being in 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 this part of Canada. I mean, like I I'm. I'm pretty centrist, but I definitely lean further left than you. I think that's come out. So you need. Before, so so like, you'll look. Yeah. You'll assess your riding. You'll assess the, the you know the, the geographical riding you're in, and you'll try to forecast who you think might be best in that situation, or who might need your the assistance of your vote. In other words, when you say you're a strategic voter, you'll vote for a party in some circumstances that wouldn't be your party, but you believe they're better and they need your vote to keep another party from getting in is that what you're talking about sometimes yeah uh, sometimes and and sometimes honestly and and what i think is funny to me is that you know in the parliamentary system what we're supposed to do is vote for our local representative and kind of put party aside and yes i can say there's been a couple times in the fa- in the past when i've i've genuinely just looked at people and said you know this this guy is my MP because I I like what he's saying. I like what he's saying about my community. Sure, you know that's so important. Yeah. Now the question is, do people feel like their elected representatives are actually 
representing them. Look at Lower Slave Lake right now. Lesser Slave Lake, pardon me. Uh, the, 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 the mayor, the, the, the uh, deputy mayor, both on the show, uh, talking to us about why they demanded that their MLA resign. <laughs> he won't resign. And so he's been booted from his party caucus, now sitting as an independent, unbelievable situation in Slave well, but Lake. But he said he has so many projects but to the, Yeah, but that's the type of thing where they said, they said the job of an MLA, or the job of any elected representative, but in particular, the job of the MLA is to represent us to the provincial government government not to represent the provincial government to us and people have said that as well to their federal mps or, or wherever you live in the world you know whatever system you're under to say it's not your job to communicate the government's message to us it's it, it goes the other way around you are our representative to government and you better start behaving that way let's see what real talkers are saying I mean, on the chat james says this is interesting he says election day should be a stat holiday to get more people out to get you know for more turnout uh, is it is it Blacks uh, Blacks and GR? I, I might be messing that up. Says to Mike Lake's credit, he's at least willing to listen to differing opinions, and he is. Uh, some random guy says we learned basic civics in school, but the thing is that kids, us included, really didn't care much about it because it didn't strike us as useful at the time. Gilles says, you know, mandatory when it comes to mandatory voting, mandatory to show up might work. You, you could choose to abstain, but you still need to show up. I don't know about mandatory voting. I don't is it, like. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. I, you know, I mean, you know, on one hand, Mike Lake argued, he said that, you know, mandatory voting, what about all the people that aren't necessarily educated on the vote on the, on the issues that matter? And they're going to show up and what might the implication be? Um, you know, on the flip side, uh, you know, political soldiers go out, uh, these teams, and, and they bus in kids for pizza parties and get them politically engaged. And they mobilize the vote of people that maybe are, you know, to imply that everybody who shows up to vote is educated on the issues around the election is a bit of a stretch. And a lot of times, you know, politics is just who can get the most people out, who can get the most donation dollars, who can get the most billboards. Try to buy a billboard right now in Alberta. Good luck. All the billboards are gone um, because of the municipal election coming up in the fall. So, you know, it's like who has the best team, who can mobilize, who can get out the vote. It's not who can best educate people. I don't believe that for a second. Shalane says, I'm always willing to listen when a politician takes responsibilities for their mistakes. <laughs> One of my favorite handles on our live chat, the epiphanies of Tiffany. Uh, she, maybe not necessarily mandatory voting, says Tiff, but what about mandatory courses or tests for politicians before they can run like an ethics course, like how government works? You know, there's that jerk that is seeking an election, uh, is seeking a spot on Edmonton City Council. I can't even remember his name. Doesn't matter. Wouldn't say it even if I could remember it. But he was publicly celebrating the the murder of a Calgary police officer. And people were saying, look at this. It's a candidate for Edmonton City Council that's doing it. And, and like, yeah, technically seeking. A, but so can anybody. You know, Holocaust deniers have sought election, you know, have, have sought s spots in government. I mean, anyone can run. That doesn't say anything. But you wonder about minimum standards. It's the same sort of argument that doesn't really make any sense because it's unenforceable. And, that you know, we talk about like, you know, you should have to get a license to be a parent. Well, sure, but it's not how it works. I'm going to try to hard transition into an ad read for Dairy Queen. You think I can pull this off? No matter if you're cold on politics or hot on the subject matter, the team at Dairy Queen in Northwest Edmonton well in Sherwood Park. Thanks, pal. Two for one for Real Talkers right now at those six locations owned by our pals Michael and Mark. Six packs of Dilly Bars. Two for one if you walk up to the counter, both boxes in hand, and say, Real Talk sent me. Dairy-free Dilly Bars are a thing, ladies and gentlemen. What will they think of next? Go see the team at Dairy Queen in Northwest Edmonton. And, of course, Sherwood Park as well. The team at Westworld Computers, Daryl, wanted me to remind you all that, yeah, they've got all the new gear, but right now they're overstocked on their trade-ins. So you want to upgrade your gear, but you don't have maybe necessarily what it takes to, to go brand new? Well, they've got Macs, watches, and iPhones, and they're a trusted source, of course. You're not meeting someone in a back alley off Kijiji. All their premium pre-owned Apple products go through rigorous inspection, loaded with original software, and include a minimum 30-day warranty at Westworld Computers. And of course, the team at Grand Dog Essentials wants your business like they have ours. We've been customers of theirs long before we partnered up here on the show, which is why I'm so proud to talk to you about their quality raw dog food. They've got uh, consultants there with their team, a family-owned team that can explain to you the benefit of a natural, real, nutritious, raw diet for your dogs. Get this. They deliver the food right to your door. Uh-huh. 
in Edmonton, Calgary, and Central Alberta, the Red Deer area. They're happy to compete for your business, plus 10% off your order if you quote Real Talk. That's the discount code Real Talk at granddog.ca. Before we get into the rock and roll and the air guitar and people blowing off steam, I wanted to get into some some emails that are, do I dare say, a little more cerebral. Following our conversation yesterday with the leader of the Maverick Party, Jay Hill, a former Stephen Harper government house leader, chief government whip. He's been in Ottawa for a long time, originally with the Reform Party, 1993. Jay got a lot of you talking yesterday. Some of you were disappointed in me for bringing him on the show. Sorry, not sorry. It's real talk. We're going to have a lot of conversations with people you might not see eye to eye with. That's kind of the point. Some of you were thrilled we had him on. Some of you were just intrigued with what he had to say, but it's been a while since we've received, and I'm, if you exclude Cole and if you exclude Aloha Gate, on all the other files, it's been a while since we've received so many emails on one subject, and that was our Jay Hill interview yesterday. I wanted to get to some of these. You can, of course, watch the interview if you download our podcast. Make sure you subscribe to it, or if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you'll find it on yesterday's show. It prompted Carleen to reach out. To talk at ryanjesperson.com. She says, I've just gotten into podcasts. Yours is the one that I found uh, and immediately started enjoying. Kudos, says Carleen. Thank you very much. It says, I wanted to reach out following your, your conversation with Jay Hill. My vote is undecided, but I did sign into the Wexit Facebook group the evening of our last federal election. Discouraged and angry I was, and I've since followed it quietly to this point of an actual party coming up from a collective standpoint, and it's been inspiring, says Carleen. I must say that while Wexit has seen incredible momentum, they certainly were never a realistic option. Their driving force is the collective anger of many Albertans in, in how we perceive ourselves to be treated within Confederation. I think deep down, we all know that separation is not likely, but I would suggest that the Bloc Québécois has shown us how that idea can be leveraged into an advantage for a province. Maybe Alberta could use an advantage these days. <laughs> Amazing play on words by Carlene, intentional or not. So as nobody wants to create it for us, why can it not come from within? The Maverick Party is in its infancy, and I believe it's a culmination of those motivated enough within Wexit to actually stand up and create something more than just an angry group chat. The Maverick Party is trying to avoid separation and trying to harness negative energy into positive change, and that's why I'm following their trajectory. I don't know if they're trying to avoid separation. Jay, Jay didn't give me that impression yesterday. But back to the email. It says, I found it very unfortunate, Ryan, that while you could have helped take the conversation away from separatism, knowing that it's viewed so poorly and refocused it on their message of changed first, you did not. Carlene says, of course, many of your followers were happy to oblige with comments focused on the idiocy of separatism, and they weren't given any reason to say anything different. A new party has very few outlets to get their message out there. And while I was excited for the interview, it was disappointing in the end, as it seemed you had no intention of learning more from Jay Hill, but that you wanted to open the arena for criticism and keep the topic off what else they want to offer. It says, I think there's some value in considering that many Albertans will never again be satisfied with settling back and happily picking from red, blue, or orange. They've all failed us in various forms. There should be more conversation about this. I hoped you would offer the venue for this conversation. I was excited to tune in and learn more about their approach, but that was my mistake. She says, this was the first time I felt that your reporting was disappointingly biased. That from Carlene. I appreciate Carlene watching. I appreciate her subscribing to the podcast. I appreciate her taking the time to send me an email. Uh, I'm more inclined to read emails that criticize our show and that criticize my approach than I am to read emails that glowingly celebrate everything we do. And so I appreciate this. I am going to push back. Uh, I gave Jay Hill, you're right, a platform on Canada's most listened to daily news podcast and the fastest growing online talk show in the country because of the premise of the show. We want real talk on issues that matter, but it would be against everything I stand for to ignore the, the mandate of Alberta separation or of Western sovereignty or however you want to frame it, because if you don't discuss that in the context of the Maverick Party, what are you even talking about? It either is a separation party or it is not. Think of how you characterize, you reference the Bloc Québécois. How do you characterize that party? Their entire mandate is Quebec sovereignty, right? 
So everything around their policy, everything they stand for, everything that they uh, vote on in the House of Commons comes back to that focus, that mandate, that bedrock, if you will. But I started the interview asking Jay Hill what he'd do right now with the current situation around Keystone XL, the pipeline. That has nothing to do with separation. He took it into Alberta sovereignty, right? And I asked him other questions about policy, but you're right, Carlene, there was nothing more important to me in a conversation with the leader of the Maverick Party than asking him about Western separation, because really that's the most important thing to focus on when you're talking about the Maverick Party. So we may disagree on that. You know, when people say your reporting was disappointingly biased when it comes to keeping Canada together or not, my bias is resoundingly clear. You, your words, not mine, the idiocy of Western separation, I concur and I am pro-Canada, and my Canada includes Alberta. So that is my bias. Now, this is not an insult to you. The reality is you write your email with your bias, and everybody here is listening to me read your email through the lens of their bias. We are all biased. Let's stop pretending like we're not. This is not a 6 o'clock news show where I will be objectively presenting all of the headlines. I'm here for my hot takes and yours, and I appreciate your email very sincerely. Jeff wrote in to say, I'm glad, Ryan, you're willing to interview somebody you don't agree with. He says, I don't either, by the way, but I think having the Jay Hill, the leader of the Maverick Party on your show is a great idea, even if a lot of what he had to say was difficult for me to hear. Jeff says, just the other day, I was having an online debate about where uh, all of Alberta's savings from the boom years went. He says, I recalled reading a comment many years ago that in Quebec, that's where you'll find it. Thanks to equalization payments, but I argued it was because we've been relying on royalty revenues for day-to-day operational expenses. It's why we haven't had to bring in a sales tax. But once again, somebody responded to me with a big, long spiel about billions of dollars that Alberta's income taxpayers have sent to federal coffers, yada, yada, yada. Jay Hill brought up those same things in the interview. Even with equalization payments, we still could have put much more in the heritage savings kitty. Jay talked about Norway yesterday. Jeff says, as I've been out of work since March of last year, I'm longing for the days when we had those triple digit oil prices. You could walk in any workplace with your resume, it seemed, and they'd almost hire you on the spot. But those days aren't coming back anytime soon, no matter who we have in government. That from Jeff. And what about this from Christina B? Christina B says, uh, Ryan, I just tuned in and watched that Jay Hill interview. I've been a longtime supporter of the conservative party. Uh, even as a centrist, I've occasionally voted NDP, but recently I found myself partyless says Christina. Now, it should be noted that I am not a separatist. I fully support a united Canada, but I do recognize the West is underrepresented in Ottawa. Christina says, I support the Maverick Party, and here's why. When I emailed Jay with a few questions about the Maverick movement, he was quick to reply, even followed up with a phone call to me, the leader of the party. It was clear in our chat that I have a hard time supporting another old white guy. I told him that. He told me this party is about progress, about LGBTQ2S plus Canadians feeling represented, that it's about fair and equitable representation for Western Canadians. Separatism, while part of the party's platform, is not the sole directive of the party. Jay told me he does believe we need balanced green initiatives and sustainable development of the oil sands. He supports women in politics. I mean, I hope so. And express there should be absolutely more women representing Canadians on the political stage. Christina says, I support the party because they're serious in developing a platform that includes voices from the left, the center, and the right. I don't know. (laughs) To govern on the voices of members and constituents, is that not what we all want? Yes, it is. A party that actually listens to the people. Christina says, despite the name, which is very difficult to get past, it actually is a party for the party less and not so far right as many as uh, as many are being led to believe. She says, I was disappointed to see so many closed-minded comments on the YouTube live chat. She says, have a fantastic day to all the real talkers. That from Christina B. Thank you. It was some of, somewhat of a merciless scenario on the real talk uh, live chat yesterday. I'll acknowledge that. We got a message from Nikki. Uh, Nikki says, you know, I guess probably my biggest issue with all of that. She says, when he talks about the mistakes that Quebec made, Quebec has amazing leverage federally, considering, you know, now because of these supposed mistakes, that's a bunch of nonsense. She says, I guess my biggest issue with all this is Jay Hill himself. He represents one half of his long pairing with Stephen Harper. So why is Stephen Harper involved in this? Asks Nikki. I mean, it's pretty rich 
for an ousted prime minister who affected very little of substance in Alberta during his own tenure to now be involved with this group. And there's no way they actually believe it will have traction, says Nikki. They called it the Maverick Party. Harper's famous for his lengthy, descriptive names and titles, she says. Just look at every bill his government ever tabled. So they pick this name? Nah. She says they're likely just using it to raise cash, kind of like Trump did with all of his fundraising for court costs. That seems to make the most sense. For what is my question? That from Nikki who then wonders if maybe they just ran out of cat food. Nikki, thank you for the message to the show. Want to remind you that if moving is part of your plan for 2021, Alta Moving and Storage is the go-to for real talkers that value local business and great service. We heard that a customer testimonial yesterday on the show. They've got these pod-style containers, so you need to move. You want to do it at your own pace and keep it stress-free. They drop off that container at your leisure. They can provide movers if you need them, or you can fill it yourself. Then again, at your leisure, they'll get it to your next destination. Plus, you're doing a home reno, maybe you require some short-term or even longer-term storage. Grandma just left you her dining room set, but you don't know where to keep it for now. Alta Moving and Storage has you covered. You can check out altastorage.ca or find them on the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Also, a shout out to the team at the Fairmont Jasper Park Lodge. They know it's difficult right now. They know that everybody's trying to make the right decision when it comes to getting out into the great outdoors, keep the kids from going squirrely, but also respecting health directives. It's why they've transformed their entire service delivery from contactless check-in to closing the dining room and ramping up their in-room delivery. Come have a skate on the lake. Come hike around Lac Beauvert with lots of distance between you and the other guests at the Fairmont jasper park lodge and of course there's the team at local waste this is the heads up for sam local waste has been in business for more than a quarter century waste management and recycling is their game and they want your business they love to talk trash so right now you can give chris or lauren labossier a call they want to hear from you you can check them out at localwaste.ca as well but if you want to call them refer to them by their first names the number 780-242-9746 they also do a little something for us on Fridays called Trash Talk. All right, Trash Talk presented by Local Waste. These are emails, rants that are sent in to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Like this one from Callan. Callan says, Jespo, Jenny's call, uh, Jason Kenny's call for U.S. Sanct- Jenny. The call for U.S. sanctions is going to backfire. It's politics. It's not real. But Southern Alberta has deep connections to the states going back to before Confederation. Economies near the border depend on that relationship. Sanctions hurt people, and it will not be lost on Americans our Albertans with American ties. Our business connections are strong. Threatening that will not play well with pro-business UC peers. That from Callan. How about this one from Arif? Arif says, Jespo, thanks for doing your video cast. My mom and I started tuning in last week. We both love your show. My conservative father thinks you're a kook. It's probably because he's just projecting his own insecurities onto others around him. That from Arif. This one from Valente, who says, I'm not sure what's happened, but since Aloha Gate, it's been one internationally embarrassing gaffe after another. Premier Kenny shocked that Joe Biden accomplished a campaign promise. As you've outlined, Jespo, Keystone was a pipeline likely never to be built, and our government gambled a billion and a half dollars on Donald Trump's re-election. Under Obama, we saw a decrease in oil production in the U.S., likely another scenario under Biden. If oil production goes down in the state, means more demand for hours. Tony says, thanks for keeping us all informed. This one from Corey, who says, with the talk of canceling KXL in the U.S., why are we not considering building a big refinery run by a crown corporation here in Alberta? That's a hot button topic. He says, I know Albertans would love to be able to buy Alberta branded oil. Just look at Alberta beef. At the very least, I'd like to learn why or why not. It's a good idea. Wouldn't it create jobs? I keep hearing it's too expensive or it's not economical. To me, it's a safer bet than dumping a billion and a half into Keystone. Appreciate that one there. And this from Gerald, who takes me to task on his trash talk. He says, Jesperson, the other day, feeling inspired, you encouraged 
encouraged us to rise up, rise up in the political process. Ryan, check yourself. Those are dangerous words, especially when we see what's happening in the U.S. I'm concerned about our society and how it's developing such divisiveness. Those on the far right will view you as a leftist and it will bolster their emotions to respond in unconstructive ways. I'd like to suggest you focus more on the positives during the time of the pandemic. Lift Albertans up. Thanks for listening. That from Gerald. You can be in touch with us anytime by sending your trash talk to talk at ryanjesperson.com presented by Local Waste. Have an amazing weekend. We will talk to you again live again Monday morning at 830 Mountain Time.